I'll uh, ping out everyone. All right, everyone, we are live. And um, uh, welcome to the sixth official episode of the Agoracast. I'm your host, Ann Cat. Today is uh, Monday, March 11th, 2024. And I'm very excited to have my guest or have as a guest, uh, Mr. Dan. Um, and, How's it um, going, everyone? I'm howdy. Dan. Um, and and the reason why I'm having this random person seemingly, you know, I don't think I don't think most people who watch me or who are in my circles will know who you are. Um, but I met you in um, who runs the the baseness server. Um, God. You know? Yeah, it's one of a few. It's either Adam or Tree or. Um. Oh, it looks like it's uh, HMS. Is that who runs? He's the, the owner. Yeah, I okay. think it might be H. He's like the figurehead. I think it might be. I think it might be him. Yeah. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I know I met you in there. I know that you are also in the Austrian server, and I'm also in the Austrian server as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, but essentially, because I've been, I was able to get to know MRH Legacy a bit through um, through the um, the base of the server that we're in, um, and that was a really great experience because I, because I've always kind of wanted to have him on the podcast um, for a while, and we did have an episode uh, last episode, of the Agora Cast. Um, oh, and I have a. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a hi. I'm your biggest fan. It's from one of the people in the servers. Well, thank oh, can you. Can we see the comments? It. Oh, we can. Very nice. Yeah. So you can look at the comments if you want to respond to some some of that. Any of them, you can. If any sure. if anyone's street watching now, you can ask questions. Um, and I can pop them up in the chat as well, or awesome. just for, for the entire uh, stream to see. Yeah. Um. But anyway, I'd ha I'd had MRH on, and I know that you were watching our stream, and you want, and we brought up SAS, and I know that you wanted to talk about SAS. So I was like. Sure. You know, shit. We need to. We need. To, we should do a SAS episode because I. I feel like a lot of people in within the libertarian community, um, aren't as familiar with his work. I know that he definitely is very popular, but um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe one of the first things. So, so before before we started this stream, um, we were talking about sort of how um SAS has brought has gotten brought up in the conversation again. Um, did you maybe want to start out sort of explaining that? Sure. So, basically, there. I guess it makes sense because of the audience. So basically yeah. what happened is um, I had was doing, so I, at least my personal discovery when it comes to SAS is it started when I was working on one of the projects. So the Austrian econ server has a, a off a website that is the resource mm -hmm. library. Um, it's called austrianlibrary.com. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working on it. And I was working on the healthcare section and right. I was doing my research and I, was just sort of scrolling on YouTube and, you know, trying to find some videos to incorporate in there instead of having it all just be, you know, papers and whatever, because that's a little boring. And I found this video called um, Socialism and Healthcare, and it was by Thomas Saz. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never seen this guy before. And so I clicked on it. And the video has very little to do with socialism and healthcare, um, surprisingly, even though that is the explicit topic, he sort of introduces it, and he just kind of talks about mental illness for the entire, for quite a bit of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it is tangentially relevant. There's some pretty good tidbits in there. Um, mm -hmm. But so, and then I sort of was like, who's this SAS guy? So I went down the rabbit hole, and then from there on, I sort of just in, ingrained myself very deeply in it um, to the point where once I had got a foundation of his work, I ended up focusing more instead of on like reading all his, he has something like 35 or 40 books and dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of papers. Right. Um, I ended up focusing more on his, um, his, uh, what's the word? Interlo interlocutors, how you may say something like that. Right. Um, people who he debates with people who have tried to rebuke him, which from which there are many. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I ended up, you end up reading a lot of very dense papers on the subject. And that's kind of where I got, you know, I feel like people sort of would come to me specifically about SAS questions. It's sort of my hobby right. horse, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and from there, um, effectively what happened is um, when I first started getting into it, um, an old buddy of mine posted something about it on Mises U. I had looked it over before, you know, he asked me to edit this. Um, and then it got some more traction in the AE server, and mm -hmm. then people started to debate it, and I didn't really want to clogging up those channels, so I created my server, which is Libertarian Psychology. Um, and then... Um, oh, yeah. Um, could, sorry to interrupt, but uh, could oh, you yeah, send no, me an no. invite to that? If yeah, 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 yeah. I'll send it um, to you. Is it, is it invite only, or are you like, no, allowing it's, it's open. to anyone? Anyone can okay. come on. 
Yeah, um, yeah if, you, if you want to link that to me, I can link that uh, server. If anyone, if anyone's curious and wants to join, um, for sure, I'll, I'll link that in the description. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it has periodic. It's periodically active, if that makes sense. But the main yeah. thing that is the whole point of it is the database that I'm continue to build um, with a few other um, with a few other mods. RVP is one of the mods there as well. Um, I see. So, but I can, I'll I'll link that at the end, and you we can put that in. Um, so effectively, and then also, you know, Guri, yes. Yeah. Can I mention? I, I'm going to mention him. Hey, um, I think he went to Mises mind. U and was discussing with people and about uh, SAS and sort of tried to influence them in the SASI direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, people got very upset with him about it because it's a very touchy subject. That's, that's why I right. feel like people are either, they either have two original reactions to the SASI project. Uh, one of them is, wow, that's quite interesting. I'm curious to sort of learn what this is about. Or sure. that sounds absurd and crazy. And how mm -hmm. could you ever think such a thing? Quite dismissive in a sort of, ironically, in a sort of way that I, that, that, that the person who says it is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that's sort of how it came to be. Um, obviously, people have been speaking about it for some time. Rothbard wrote a somewhat lengthy the article reference success quite a bit it's called psychoanalysis mm -hmm. as a weapon um uh interesting article sort of tangential to the main hobby horse of SAS, which is the mental illness bit which i can explain um and more about you know referencing SAS as political um uh i think i think guala wants to join the server i think that's what Oh, I was like, okay, I thought he wanted to like join the conversation. I was like, yeah. I mean, maybe we could let him in, but I mean, I don't, I don't think I know him very well, so. No, I don't know. Okay. But regardless, um, anyways, so yeah, that's kind of how it goes. And um, now I've been, I just continue. I've actually every every time I read, I continue to do SAS research. I I think I find the the sort of essence of it, and I continue to find more and more in depth. Mm -hmm sort of potent papers, um, some really, really good authors who are able to concisely put um, the points into a very meaningful language, which is sometimes a trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, because um, the, so the original book, I, I can give, you want me to give like a sort of a brief SAS history? Uh, yeah, sure. I feel Just free. to sort of explain to the people who yeah, may not, sure. he is, he is, perhaps known, but he's not super well known, especially not among, yeah. because he's not an economist. He's not really yeah. a political theorist. Um, well, well, interestingly enough, I have noticed that even even besides the Austrian econ server, I have noticed that like Austro-libertarian figures specifically mm -hmm. um, at least find some interest in Saz's work, because I think that I think that his work is very tangentially related. I mean, you can get into this a bit later, but I think it it provides a very interesting like methodological analysis or critique of sort of the justifications that the state gives for like the um the psych psychiatric uh, industry you know mm -hmm. yeah um i just so like before... so oh, it's, it's sort of like so, so it like sort of meshes very well in the same way that like austrianism me even though it is like a value three methodology happens to mesh very well with libertarianism in general exactly and that yeah. is in the larger, I'm going to present sort of a meta narrative later sure. on. Sure. Um, very actually related to the comment Oddity and Rarities just said, um, mm -hmm. is that um, basically, this is actually I disagree with this. Um, yeah, it's mostly left, conservatives that I found. It's, like I would say just like yeah, it's it's people who left wingers because of Foucault and Deleuze primarily, mostly Foucault. Foucault. Mm -hmm. Deleuze sort of goes a little bit differently, but mm -hmm. Foucault, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about him in the SAS history, but he yeah, has sure. influenced left-wingers to such a degree that they have gotten outside this idea of sort of institutions as facts, if that makes sense. This is right. kind of a Deleuzean point where he made, mm -hmm. you know, and then we get into the category error a little bit here, which is that modern most people today do not recognize that modern medicine is an institution 
that has a goal structure and that goal structure can be changed now that right. is different than the science behind that institution and the science mm -hmm. which they utilize just like the institution of physics has a goal structure of course it doesn't affect us as much but the most people today don't get that and therefore they take you know we we end up because of that with this fact with this sort of idea that you know do what the doctor says so to speak it's a very right. common sort of thing don't disobey your doctor um but that's just that for a point that i can talk about foucault and says later because but they they agreed quite a bit at least in foucault's original work they agreed quite a bit mm -hmm. um anyway so i guess i'll start a little bit about the dude because it, it interweaves so says gosh so he died in 2012 at 92. Mm -hmm. um so i guess that means he was born sometime in the 1930s or something like that i don't know um but he yeah, uh, 1920 1920 but i have his wikipedia page open in case i need something so okay cool so i think i have most of this memorized but effectively um says um was born in uh hungary um and I'm not sure exactly. I think he attended uh, university or and or medical school in the United States. Uh, but he is a uh, doctor and psychiatrist by education and training. Excuse me. And he um, effectively, according to him, from the beginning of his career, during even through his residency, um, had held opinions he basically held the same opinion his entire life. And the only mm -hmm. sort of proof of the pudding in that is that he got through psychiatry training without ever doing any work with involuntary patients, um, mm -hmm. which in the 1950s, when he was in medical school, was no yeah. easy feat. Um, mm -hmm. And so he started off kind of at a disadvantage. Um, difficult to know to what degree he actually avoided what was mandatory at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was just a choice. You could do that or you could do, I don't know, community work. But he didn't do that. And throughout his life, he maintained that he never did any involuntary treatment uh, with people. Mm -hmm. And then in the ninth, late 1950s, he started publishing some very um, sort of encoded words, sort of, or I should say encoded papers. They would talk about um, They would talk about this idea of the myth of mental illness, but because he hadn't coined the term yet, uh, these were just sort of papers that he was writing um, whilst in, I guess, after his medical school or through his residency. Um, mm -hmm. And probably as he was getting into professorship, because he was a professor at um, um, SUNY in, in New York, in upstate New York, um, mm -hmm. for most of his career. Um, can you hear me? My computer screen just went blank. Oh, no. you're Yeah, you're fine. Oh. I hope my computer doesn't shut off. Okay. Okay. Um, that'll suck. Whatever. Um, however, um, and so after, around, it was in 1960 that he wrote a six-page paper called The Myth of Mental Illness. Um, mm -hmm. And many people think it was a book. Um, like, I or think that the book was the first sort of thing. No, the book actually came yeah. a year later in 61. Yeah. Um, and I actually prefer people read the paper first because it's only six pages mm -hmm. and it basically summarizes the main point of the book. Um, okay. And I actually have it pulled up because I love it so much. Yeah. I, um, I knew that he, I knew that the book was originally a paper. It was a paper called the same thing. And then yeah, a year later he wrote the book. So yeah. Uh, the book contains quite a bit of history. Mm -hmm. The first bits of it. Um, interesting history. Mm -hmm. But it can kind of, I, I remember getting through it because I had tried to read it originally before I really knew much about Saz, or I just mm -hmm. learned about him. And trudging through the parts on Charcot, I'm like, okay, this is cool, but like, where's the, where's right. the main, where's the, where's the, the kicker? And it doesn't right. come until the second section. Yeah. Um, not really, anyway. Um, so I don't even recommend people read it too much. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's, that's just sort of what I, yeah, that's that. It, it, there are other books which I, which I can talk about. Uh, sure. But after that, after that bomb of a title, and I, I suspect that Ta, that says wrote it this way, did this title, not because he thought it was like the best title, but 
A, because he kind of writes titles that are sort of cliche in all of his books. Like mm -hmm. one of my favorite books of his is called The Meaning of Mind. Pretty cliche title. Yeah. Um, cool title, but cliche. Um, but also just to piss people off. I think he intentionally did it to like get a stir. And it totally worked because it sparked his career and gave him employment. So um, yeah, works for him. And then from there, so to speak, the rest is history. He would go on to write a bunch of books, uh, 35 to 40 books. Gosh, I think he has more uh, like papers than Rothbard, which shocked me when I saw it. Oh, wow. Um, he's got at least a comparable amount to Rothbard. Like he writes that much. Um, about every topic under the sun. If you want to know what Thomas has thought about something, go to Google Scholar, quote Thomas says, and whatever topic you want about, you'll probably find it. And if you don't find it from him, you're going to find it from one of his followers. Because um, he had a bunch of students. Um, there was a small group at Towson University, obviously some folks at Syracuse and SUNY. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just sort of around, uh, you know, the anti-psychiatry community. Yeah. Um, and um and, and speaking of actually I did want to ask you, um just just out of personal curiosity, was Saz um did Saz remain a liberal throughout his life or did he ever actually go full um like Rothbard pill? Did he ever like take the anarchy pill? No, he was a classical liberal for the duration of his life. Okay. As far as I can tell, he didn't change his perspective very much. Mm -hmm. Um he also never espoused his political theory in a sort of complete way. It, like yeah. um Rothbard did in the sense, in the way that he would espouse it, it was because it was relevant to. Yeah. And, and to um, be fair, like, yeah. regardless of if Saz was a libertarian or he was a liberal, like, I don't really, I don't really think that that has a lot of relevance for his actual work. I think the work, the work is valuable in both contexts. So, I mean. Oh, yeah. I yeah. think, I think. But, I th but I think it, it, it complements libertarianism the best, like fully when you take like the, the anarchy pill. Yeah. Um. Well, so actually, let me talk about that, because that's a really sure. good point that I would like to make. Um, so this is something that when I was, you know, being slowly pulled down by the anchor of anarchism um, mm -hmm. and I was still a minarchist, one of the things that had really bothered me for some time, um, and this just goes to show that answers come, but they just fall into your lap sometimes. And what happened was I was very sort of concerned about well, how, you know, what, what would happen to, like, people who want to kill themselves? Like, what would actually right. happen under an anarchist society? Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, that is a book called The Prohibition of Suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very concerned about that. And I was like, and I couldn't quite figure out what would happen. I guess the answer in my head was just, like, they would kill themselves. But that seems wrong. It seems bad. There's problems with that. And with Saz, he kind of really skirts, he skirts the problem of, mental health in an anarchist society by effectively let me let me just sort of present his argument briefly so because that will make everyone or the few people watching familiar with exactly what he was trying to say so basically says the main the the the, the main thesis that says that he had quite a bit but the main thesis is that um, what we call mental illness is essentially defined by a political process and that is to say it is defined by a ethical political social process instead of what it appears to be defined by which is a medical process and those two are different because medicine is a descriptive science of the world which makes descriptive facts about the world and yeah. politics and ethics and social studies or sociology or what may you are prescriptive sciences which make ought statements about the world mm -hmm. so what effectively he is saying is that there are groups of people in our society that are that behave differently maybe for it's from what we consider to be normal or perhaps what it's um, what we consider to be statistically average we can debate on that but mm -hmm. there are people that we would call socially deviant and these people who are socially deviant um we call those people, or the history is quite important here, we might call those people crazy, um, or we might call them autistic or mm -hmm. schizophrenic, or it starts, of course, off a little bit less because in the early days it was hysteria and mania and psychosis were the real, mostly hysteria and mania, mostly with women. Um, yeah. But that's a separate point. Anyway, um, 
so what Sass is basically arguing is that these truly moral, ethical, political judgments are masquerading themselves as medical judgments and therefore being taken as fact. So it is not the case yeah. that you are socially deviant and your social deviance is a mere difference from the norm or from what I, Saz would say, from what you think is permissible or what you think is comfortable. Because um, Saz would go on to say most of the time that people are like in the streets or whatever, or a, a, a common quality of mental illnesses is that they make us uncomfortable. And that might be part right. of the reason. Yeah. Um, but instead, they are masquerading as as a medical disease, and this is the fault of psychiatrists. Um, the history of which really dates primarily back to Freud, because Freud was the first one who figured out how to. He was Freud was brilliant, actually, in the sense that he figured out how to make a career out of this myth. Um, mm -hmm. Not just a career, but what ended up becoming an entire industry. Of course, he was not the first; there were other. But he was Freud was great and brilliant in the sense that. He was the first to really make it like a private thing. Most of the yeah. time, these were doctors who worked for hospitals. And back in the day, some very common says point is they back they never used to be called insane asylums or madhouses. They were called state houses because mm -hmm. um, they were owned by the state, and that's where you kept the undesirables. Um, and the technical term for this masquerading of political um, unwanted behaviors, which are defined politically or, or, or personally um, as medical um, malformations or diseases is uh, what might be called a category error, which is a term mm -hmm. hoisted from Gilbert Ryle in his book. Um, uh, what the hell is it called? The Concept of Mind, mm -hmm. uh, which he makes, uses the term category error to basically, um, I don't want to say debunk, but it's heavily and substantially critique Descartes. Descartes' dualism, mm -hmm. um, I think, successfully. But Saz hoisted that term and used it to describe this. And of course, a category error is just sort of a informal logical error. Actually, I would maybe say it's a formal logical error. Uh, yeah. But it, you can use it as a as a you know as a fallacy, basically. Right. So that's effectively the argument, um, and it has a lot of different moving parts. And you can there are. The, the argument was attacked in many different areas. A common area of attack um, by, I would say, his, the, I would say the best area of attack is to question, uh, well, okay, is medicine really a sort of an objective science? What does that actually mean? Right? Is this a spectrum? Mm -hmm. That's a hard point. It, when, when you meet someone who can uh, sort of really hold their own, on that, it it, it it certainly uh, it's difficult. But that's that's yeah. sort of if you were to if you want to take down Saz, go for the knees, and that those are the knees right there. Yeah. Um. So that is essentially the the argument. Um. Mm -hmm. And you know, sort of briefly, uh, the history. You know, quite a bit of Saz is also focused on history, as he even talks about the history for. 50, 60, 70 pages prior to even really getting into the mental illness bit, the real argument mm -hmm. in myth of mental illness. Um, and the history is quite interesting. There are, of course, some earlier examples, but effectively, here is a, the, the following case is typical um, in the, maybe the 1800s, I would say. Mm -hmm. A elite family, whether politically or um, economically powerful, has either a spouse or more seriously a child who behaves socially deviant perhaps they bathe themselves 10 times a day or perhaps then when they see people they don't look them in the eyes and they stutter quite a bit and they want to be alone all the time these are characteristics mm -hmm. of ocd or autism or something but it sure. could also be perhaps they look out the window and they seek and they think when they jump out the window they will go up instead of down mm -hmm. these are these are characteristics that are not quote unquote normal mm -hmm. uh, just statistically and you know furthermore um, you know statistically you're also like culturally I guess you could say mm -hmm. and so what would happen is that well these elite families have a sort of decision to make right they're they have a lot of wealth they have a lot of power and someone needs to inherit that 
And it's supposed to be the kid who is autistic or schizophrenic mm-hmm. or bipolar or whatever. So sometimes the family, knowing that their reputation is at stake, knowing that the future of the of the family is at stake, calls for a doctor. Now, most doctors may not do much about it. They may say, well, there's nothing wrong with this person medically that I can find. Um, but in another instance, they may sort of abide by the reason for which they were called because oftentimes doctors were employed privately back then and without sort of the wealth of these particular families they might have trouble as an industry or at least personally um so what they might do is they might come up with something they may say there's no there is perhaps something wrong or perhaps we should take him for observation or perhaps there's a lesion and this was of course prior to you know they 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 obviously didn't cut him open there but they they might take him and um what happens after that he may stay in in a hospital for some for some while a state house um he may be lobotomized he may have electroconvulsion therapy they just want to do something so that he this this child is no longer in in line to sabotage the family so to speak potentially compromise and this mm-hmm. is kind of how this started and an industry developed around this because it was these very powerful families who had the means for this desire they had this very strong desire that some um family member be out of out of order for Mm -hmm. a little bit or at least not able to continue on and be the head of the family like they were and because they had so much political influence and power and money an industry effectively formed around this um and of course this led to the funding of research for these particular what would become to be called neuroses but were effectively hysteria now of course in the 1800s the term hysteria and mania had already existed um and really those i think those terms came really around the same time that the idea of the individual and the mind came in the enlightenment area um mm-hmm. but of course they were just seen as sort of They were not seen as strictly medical. The instances of sort of um, mass hysteria, or not even mass hysteria, but just individual instances of of hysteria, were not seen as something which required treatment. It was just a disturbance. And then people might call local authorities to have these people stop doing whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure. Are you familiar with Salmonella, the YouTube channel? Um, Yes, yeah. There's this one video about mass psychogenic illness and sort of the medieval days um Mm -hmm. and in the video and you can confirm this it's an interesting source but you know whenever this was happening people they would not get arrested they wouldn't get arrested they wouldn't any they would just you know just be like you gotta stop doing what you're doing here you know there was for Mm -hmm. example a bunch of nuns that started meowing for like 12 days and they were just like listen they did threaten them with violence but they weren't this was never there was nothing about medicine it was more about uh, pestering and annoyance mm-hmm. um anyway so that's sort of where the history really started and then of course it morphed slowly particularly in the early 1900s with the invention of what was called at the time dementia precox or precox um, which later was termed schizophrenia mm-hmm. uh, by a guy named eugen bloiler who was a, a german or austrian psychiatrist um and effectively, these terms, you know, the if you, what you may see in the movies is effectively, unfortunately, correct, where you will have these uh, particular doctors who sort of take on this idea as like a side part, mm-hmm. um, as like sort of their little personal project and like do part, really heinous experiments on people, lobotomies and stimulation while they're alive or just like mm-hmm. put them in a chamber and see how they react or something like that. And then they'll present it. Uh, if you've seen ever a movie about like where you do live surgery in front of people, they will do that with mental patients too. Um, but effectively, that is how it ended up quickly sort of masquerading itself into the world of medicine because the people who never once was this outside of the domain of medical professionals um, because there was no one else they could call these mm-hmm. these powerful families they can't call the police because what the hell are the police going to do 
Mm -hmm. Also, yes, you're politically influential, but you can't have your son arrested for no reason. Mm -hmm. So they're not doing anything illegal. And there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that you don't like what they're doing. And unscrupulous doctors took advantage of this opportunity, I suppose mm -hmm. you could call it. Um, but also in the history, do we find the characteristics of mental illness? That is what I just said. It's not illegal, right? It's not illegal to be schizophrenic, although that's mm -hmm. changing. And uh, there's nothing medically wrong with you. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a whole lot of contentiousness that people will talk about with chemical imbalances and fMRI scans and blood tests and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But the main, yeah, because because yeah. one of the main one of the bigger criticisms that I've seen, and I don't think this criticism holds up very well, is that um, well, no, actually there are some things that we would call mental illnesses that actually do have a pathogen that we can identify that 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 is something that would be objectively wrong sure. with someone. Mm -hmm. But I feel, but I feel like, but I feel like Saz, um, Saz would respond, and I, I think I don't know if you would agree with this, but he would respond in saying that, well, then we wouldn't, we would, we wouldn't call that a mental illness; we would call that a brain disease. You know? Yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know be, because you know we can actually Saz. identify the pathogen there. Yeah, you know about Saz. He has a paper. It's called "Mental Illness versus Brain Disease." That's the name of that. That's the title. Of the oh, paper. okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I know him well. Well, actually, he um, for anyone curious, and I'll I'll link this. Um, down in the chat for anyone in interested, but there's a really great, um, for anyone also kind of curious, um, he goes on uh, William F. Buckley Jr.'s show. Great one. Um, Perfect. Yeah, really and, one. He, and he also has some of his uh, disciples as well ex explain it very well. Um, and so for anyone kind of interested in like learning just the very basic argument, um, and Dan, actually, I think he did a really good job just explaining it very, very densely, because I think that is the core of the argument. It is a it's a it's a category error in that it's an ethical problem, not a um, and political problem, not a uh, like an objective medical problem. Mm -hmm. And and so it's like, so it's it's essentially trying to medicalize ethics, you know. Yeah. You're scratching your nose. Oh, there's something wrong with you medically. We need to fix you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you you can always find there's always keys to figure it out. Um, particularly. He has, and this is a little bit, I actually have not thought about this enough mm -hmm. to say whether I super duper agree with it or not. Mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, to the people who may know me, uh, I don't take every opinion Saz has, um, just what? most of them. Yeah. I know, exactly. <laughs> um, but in this relatively unknown article or um, interview, which I can find, um, he basically, they were talking about anorexia with the host. Mm -hmm. And he makes a really interesting, he tied, Saz was not trained in existentialism. I mean, it was happening very relatively near his life, just prior, mostly, to when he got into psychiatry. So it was still fresh. But he says, why does someone, why, so most people who are anorexic statistically um, are teenage girls, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's still the case today. It was much more the case um back then. That, of course, doesn't mean to say that there are anorexic people who aren't teenage girls. That's also not true. Mm -hmm. But statistically, they are the, the biggest category. And so Sass says, well, why? What is a potential explanation for what that could be if it's not just the, some sort of chemical problem or mental brain faculty, which they lack? Well, he says, well, it's because in today's society, they are sort of doing a biological existential rebellion against their just what they know against socialization they know mm -hmm. that in 1950s 60s 70s america they're going to have to grow up they're going to have to be wives they're going to have to bear children and they don't want to do that and mm -hmm. they can't express that because then they will be shunned by their families and their families will say oh you know whatever whatever you know that that is an explicit desire right now you have exp you have made clear your intentions of why you are acting out mm -hmm. but instead if you simply don't eat of course i i cannot believe people do not see the parallels of hunger strikes and anorexia hunger strikes when a man an irish hunger striker doesn't eat in in you know in mm -hmm. political protest he's not mentally ill. We don't even think for a moment he's mentally ill because he has a clearly defined goal structure which society can accept. But the teenage girl 
does not we cannot accept at least at the time right because at the time the status quo was mm -hmm. women are second class citizens you grow mm -hmm. up you will bear children you will be married and you will like it mm -hmm. and society when you're rebelling against society and the status quo you can't it, it can't accept it so it has to come up with an alternative reason for why you're acting the way that you're acting mm -hmm. it can't we don't accept those that particular rebellion and mm -hmm. of course also the case is that most of the time these were not vocalized um uh how you may say ex uh, values um mm -hmm. but it still may have been a particular instance because of what you know these differences in genders and ages upon which these things schizophrenia is another great example i find it very weird that a disease such as schizophrenia has sudden onset around the age of 19 to 22 precarious time for men young men in their lives mm -hmm. right they are under a great deal of stress usually in college usually trying to figure out what their life is perhaps they have had some difficulty with a girl perhaps mm -hmm. they're having troubles with their family but also schizophrenia has very interesting what they will call sudden onset mm -hmm. or su sudden onset and then sudden recovery right you'll have it for three years and then the, of course when the precarious time is over you return to, nor to normal right and you know perhaps this is another issue right perhaps they may find that schizophrenia is a is a brain disease of course then there's no need for psychiatry right because you just go to neurologists right they used to treat epilepsy as a mental illness right yeah now you don't we would never consider treating epilepsy as a mental illness nowadays right um but you know even so but my this is what i was saying when it's like you kind of have to suss it out mm -hmm. with for example schizophrenia i mean there are easy ones adhd uh, anxiety and depression are the three easiest ones to be like okay this is how can you have depression if you don't act depressed right mm -hmm. how can you have adhd if you focus right saz makes a comparison he says how can you have smoking disease if you don't smoke how can you be addicted right. to something if you don't do it and that's that's the key and that's that's part of the category error yeah because right? there's a difference between um an action which you perform and a disease which you have mm -hmm. and one we masquerade an action which you perform as a symptom of a disease of right course, with mental illness and disease and the mental illness um the technical term for a cause of a disease is the etiology of it mm -hmm. now with etiologies with mental illnesses there is no etiology there's no mm -hmm. quote-unquote medical cause because it's a it's a either consciously subconsciously or unconsciously a desire which you are now expressing in your action so when says and this is this is the way that says explains it in one of his, in the socialism lecture that i mentioned at the beginning right mm -hmm. how can you have smoking disease if you don't smoke he says all psychiatric diseases are in this class they're just more subtle right how can you have mm -hmm. schizophrenia if you don't act the way that you're schizophrenia or mm -hmm. if you don't act in a schizophrenic manner and people might say well what are you talking about schizophrenia is not an action but Saz is saying it is because there is no pathology behind it there's no lesion there's no chemical imbalance there's no there's nothing we can find demonstrably that says this is a, a bodily malformation or something along those lines so unfortunately we are left until that is proven because we're not going to assume that it is a a biological malformation if we have zero evidence for it then mm -hmm. the only other explanation is that it must be within your uh your the control of yourself to some degree mm -hmm. or if you're religious it's an act of god that's another Actually, explanation yeah um so that that is sort of part of that's a very important point to make yeah um, um we actually did have like a couple critiques of says in the comments here um one of them was uh, how can you claim mental illness is a myth when indians exist <laughs> oh i thought it was serious for a second i was oh like, no, no no i know i was just, I was just <laughs> well you've had a no. serious tone this is a compelling perspective sure um I mean, I mean, shit. I, I mean, Indians existing, honestly, just kind of derail your whole argument. Well, so here's sort of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So India, I can't come up with anything fast enough. 
Uh, okay. Um, one of the other ones was like, um, was my ADHD mental illness means I can't I can't do things that I don't like doing. I don't like washing up. Washing up, therefore, is a symptom of a disease. Exactly. Yes. So I'm of course, serious, of obviously. course, he's not being serious. Yeah. But yeah, that yeah. is the thing that right. A common Sazian tactic was to sort of be really um, vocal and hyperbolic um, when he was doing these lectures. Um, so mm-hmm. there, I, because I've just seen these clips so many times, I can paraphrase. Um, you know, so he he always sort of says like, there's this one quote where he says, "Well, as children, we are beholden to our parents, of course, um, but when we co- become adults." Right, there. Are, when he is saying that the institution of psychiatry kind of acts like an adult upon us, in the same sense that the state acts like it, it, it's a form of paternalism. He may even go so far as to say that psychiatry is the state is the state's paternalism. Mm-hmm. Um, and what he says is, so we are now effectively when we turn eighteen, we're supposed to go to our leader in our government and say, I can't control myself, please control me, right? Because people right. people do have a desire for this. And that is, of mm-hmm. course, why Freud was so successful. Well, mm-hmm. I should rephrase. Freud was successful because the medical authorities were treated quite differently than they are now. Skepticism was significantly less. Right. Um, but part of the reason, I mean, a large reason that they are now, and I suggest would still be in an anarchist society, largely... Uh-huh. I would be shocked if everyone was doing Sazian style therapy or whatever, you know, which is, has no particular form. But um, the main point is, is that if you can convince your clientele that this is the case, it's no different than marketing. But of course, we have to recognize that it is in that category. It's no yeah. different than that is a story that a company tells to its clientele. Uh, no different, practically. Mm-hmm. Of course, Saz would say that uh, psychiatry is a, a religion. Uh, and he has three or four books specific. He's got like the second sin and then something about like something about like whatever, whatever. He's got a lot of books on uh, the parallels between psychiatry and religion, mm-hmm. uh, psychiatry and the state as as the God. Right. Uh, what is it? The disease, the mental illness as the sin, our confession, which is therapy, our treatment, mm-hmm. which is, you know, whatever. The confession therapy one is, is I think, the most potent. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't read these books, or I read one a little while ago, so I don't know exactly. But he's got a great lecture on it called about psychiatry and religion. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll you'll have it. to um after the stream, you'll have to send me some links because what I'll probably do is if you if you send me those links privately, I'll mm-hmm. compile them together and put them in my resources channel because I have a whole um channel just for like resources and I can pin it for anyone. Yeah, I hear you. Um, let's see. So yeah, um, let me see if there's anything else I can. T- unless you have any specific questions, I can keep. Um going. yeah, sure. Actually, well, I think what would be interesting is to maybe, um, maybe now that you've kind of laid out the argument, um, you can maybe go over some common criticisms of Saz's work, and then maybe sure. you can explain what Saz's rebuttal to that would be, or I guess what your rebuttal to those criticisms would be, like what your problem with it, uh, with those criticisms is. Sure. Um. Okay, so I'll go over a few common ones. I don't want to get too technical sure. because uh, some of the really technical ones are still fresh in my head and I haven't written about them yet. Right. Um, uh, you can go over the one where you, because um, you mentioned one of the most common critiques. Um, it essentially is to argue that, um, like, that even medicine as a science isn't entirely isn't entirely like devoid of moral ah yes so this hmm, so let's see here this is so this here's the problem with it well i wouldn't say the problem much like with praxeology and austrian economics Mm -hmm. uh, this is what i'll get i'll get into that soon um yeah because that's the main that's the that's not the grand narrative but it's something that i want to talk about um much like with praxeology Psychi or SAS's system a differs under different med- different medical presuppositions and holds under every medical metaphysical short of maybe nihilism uh, mm-hmm. presupposition. Um, 
And so the two main ones, so RVP, for example, is a hard physicalist, right? Big in physicalism. I am not. I'm not a physicalist. So uh, we're going to have different. And Sass himself, I, we disagree on this. Sass himself, I would say, is not a physicalist, not in the strict sense, or not a exhaustive physicalist. He thinks there are non-physical um, components, namely the mind. And So um, maybe just for the viewers, um, could you explain just very briefly what the difference between um, physicalism and non-physicalism is? I can do my best. So what I say okay. physicalism, because I there are different sort of connotations here, and mm -hmm. some might disagree with me. Um, when I say physical, someone is a physicalist, I mean that all causes all things that we encounter in our mm -hmm. reality are explainable. They bottom out in something material or physical. So a good example in context would be when I perform an action, that mm -hmm. action is perpetrated by my brain, which is further mm -hmm. perpetrated by specific neurons and somehow, we don't know, originated. Mm -hmm. But we know that it must be originated in a physical process. There is no sort of hocus pocus, um, corporeal or um, immaterial substance. There's nothing beyond the material world. It is a very common view today. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a view which underpins a lot of scientific work as well. Um, physics, as you may guess, sort of operates, depending on your interpretation, but mostly operates on a physicalist basis. Mm -hmm. Whereas religion, eh, it doesn't really. Of course, religion is not a science, but it's an example. Right. Um, so when I say non-physicalist, I just mean that there are some instances, at least one instance, where an explanation a causal explanation can't or doesn't bottom out in a physical in in a physical substance. There is not necessarily an immaterial substance, but a non-physical cause. Right? We can't touch this cause. It doesn't exist, sort of, uh, in the material world. It's not an object. It's not a physical object. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm arguing that says is that. Um, and in the context of this, this non-physical thing might be free will. Um, I would argue praxeologically, well, praxeologically different because it doesn't really talk about the motivations of action, so I'm going to refrain from that. Um, anyway, what was the point? That well, but, but, well, actually, this is something that I did want to ask you about because are you, are you a free willer or are you a determinist? I am in favor of free will. Okay. Um, Saz was as well. Um, yeah, I, I would, that would be my guess. Yeah. Well, but I think like, but, but I think there's there is kind of a big issue where I think the conversation around free will and determinism can get a little muddy, where it's like, okay, are you talking about free will in the sense of like the social sciences or like biology, right? In how human beings operate, like the difference, for, for instance, between like we would say maybe a human has free will, whereas an animal or a plant does not. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think Mises actually talks about this, even though he would consider himself a determinist. All I'd, although I'd argue that he's talking about it in a different sense, where I would he's agree. saying like it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't make sense to say, um, oh yeah, a boulder chose to roll down the hill and then chose to crack into a million pieces. Exactly. I think he has this quote about like critiquing behaviorism, where he says um, the the problem with the beh behaviorist is to try and explain um, the like the um, basically how the how um the, the conquering of of uh, of of nations the um cathedrals built by humans essentially are comparable to like plants growing you know um, he would say that's not so true yes yeah okay um, yeah it, it's so basically like for for i think so what what i think would and i've talked with um are you familiar with uh esso and filthy who run the channel uh, back alley philosophy at all what's it called uh, they run a channel called uh, Back Alley Philosophy. Oh yes, I am familiar with that channel. Yeah. Um. So, I'm I'm friends with him, and we've had these long conversations about this. And he thinks that essentially, um, that what Mises would argue, or at least maybe he wouldn't call it free will, but essentially the standard of demarcation between, um, between the social and the natural sciences would be would essentially be praxeology which is grounded in the notion of free will so the, the social sciences has to be built 
basically from the foundation of a praxi logical understanding of human human action. So sure. There's, so for instance, um, right, like it, so if we're going to claim that human beings are essentially determinist in nature, if we're going to take the behaviorist pill, um, we wouldn't be able to then conclude that human beings act purposefully. Basically, every action from a human perspective would essentially be the equivalent of a doctor, you know, hitting your knee and it's just reflexive. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess. Well, see, I think well, for one, I think praxeology works under both determinism and free will. So I don't think that free will is required for praxeology. And I think that bottoms out in the fact that what is necessary is the existence of choice, not whether that choice is free. Does that make sense? I don't know. If um, that makes, it's a little off topic. But ooh, uh, what's I, I don't which, know. which might require another axiom of choice exists. It's been a while since I've delved into this, but whether yeah. or not intention is something which originates from a person or it flows through a person, because that is sort of the determinist view is that, okay, we're not denying that there is intention because intention is aboutness in a sort of philosophical right. sense, if you were to harken back to Anscombe or Whit Wittgenstein. Yeah. Um, attention, intention is aboutness. And when you do mm -hmm. a thing, you're quote unquote about that thing. Mm -hmm. So that totally exists. There's no denying that that can, that's Anscombe's argument. Um, or one of her arguments uh, relating to not I, for free will, but assume that that intention is something which flows through you. It's still there. So you still have mm -hmm. intention. It's still a goal-oriented action. It just might not be your goal, or it might not be a goal which is originated by your consciousness or your free mm -hmm. will, so to speak. So in that sense, I think you can still do the praxeology because you still have intention. You still have means to end. You still have the action axiom, so to speak. Right. I okay. I can kind of. I can. I'm kind of seeing what you're getting at here a little bit, at least. Yeah. It's just you know a safe. I mean, I don't have like crazy amazing arguments for free will. I can tell you that a lot of the science surprisingly seems to support it. Um, i.e., Libet and his followers. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, some people don't like Libet. Um, it, it seems like though, like if you're gonna argue the determinist viewpoint is like i'm wondering how you even make the distinction from that point between just behavior and purposeful action what what specifically would make an action a means to ends oriented if you could just tie everything back to um just a more a, a more complex version of right. you know a doctor hitting your knee or someone pushing you right down well, the I, of stairs. I guess my question for that I want to flip it back on you. How can we do that anyway? The answer, how can we make this demarcation anyway? And the answer is an empirical question. It's not praxeological, it's timeological. Mm -hmm. um, so the, how do we know a thing is within the domain of free will or not? How do we know if an action is an action explicitly can't really be part of praxeology because it starts with the existence of action. Um, so Mises, you know, as far as I'm concerned, granting action is is all that is needed for praxeology to be valid because it's a logic it's an a priori logical system um mm -hmm. whether and what that action is whether it's motive you know how it comes into fruition whether or not it is an action is explicitly not praxeological now that's sort of a non-answer um it skirts the problem but it's a non-answer what assume determinism right and then mm -hmm. you know then now let me actually answer the question um so how would we demarcate between like a reflex um, and like an actual action? Honestly, I don't believe in in this in this route. So my answer would probably be it would have to be bottom. It would have to be figured out empirically. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in a world which is completely deterministic um, and which everyone agrees is deterministic, I think the empirical avenue becomes a lot more valuable. You know, for example. You could just exclude all. We know that reflexes don't reach the brain. As mm -hmm. far as we can tell in medical science, they don't reach the brain. Now, of course, if you ask me about fMRI studies later, I'm going to critique this, the the method which I used to just get here. But fMRI study, you know, we would when you touch the knee, it doesn't even enter the brain. It's just like mm -hmm. the only way to there's no. It happens before the neurons get there or the the system gets there. So that we might not have a great definition, but we could say okay reflexes are totally out of the picture because they can't even get into the brain. We don't even mm -hmm. know. 
Um, so we may not have a great definition, but kind of like Wittgenstein says, or not what Wittgenstein says, but um, I have this idea that I use in the Sazian project of um, when defining diseases of over an over-inclusive definition. And I derive it from Wittgenstein's idea of, of sort of family relations and language games. Um, and effectively, um, we may not be able, so we'll never be able to tell what the exact definition of anything is. We can't describe it. It just can't work. You can't say, what is a cup? What is the right. essence of a cup? Can't do it. Mm -hmm. But we can say, we can make an exclaim about what, to what like, cups, all cups are things that hold something, mm -hmm. right? If a cup doesn't hold something, it's not a cup. That's true for all cups. But the issue is that that also includes things which aren't cups, like baskets. Right. However, it's still having that definition of a cup of things which hold another thing is still better than having no definition. It still right. goes down in the grand scheme quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And Saz does this when he kind of makes this argument with um, diseases. He says all diseases are physical. Now, of course, many things are physical. But mm -hmm. you know what's not physical? Behave like action is not a physical thing. Of course, we know this praxeologically. Right. But so therefore, if you smoke quite a bit or you can't pay too much attention or perhaps you're sad or perhaps you're crazy. Mm hmm. I shouldn't say crazy. Perhaps you act in a way which is deep <laughs> right. crazy. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, then those those can't be diseases because if you don't do them, you don't have those qualities. Right. So that's like the basic basic litmus test mm -hmm. um, that says gives us. And actually, I should make a point um, about the the myth of mental illness. This is a really common point. You were uh, this actually also ties into the rebutal. Um, mm -hmm that you asked me about how what are some common arguments against us you know what the most common argument is it's not really um it's partially emotional based emotive um mm -hmm. but it's also has a little bit of validity and it's that well how can you see a person who is schizophrenic and then not say they have mental illness or say it's quote unquote their fault or say they're not suffering mm -hmm. well of course so number one, the myth of mental illness, right? When Sass mm -hmm. says myth, he quite literally means like a mythology, a mythos, right. a story, um, a metaphor. So there's nothing wrong with saying someone is mentally ill, believe it or not. Just like there's nothing wrong with saying, um, let's say someone's skating and they do a kickflip. Oh, that's a sick kickflip, man. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying, oh, the world is sick nowadays. I hate it. And there's nothing wrong right, with right, saying, right. yeah, there's the, the proper, the only reason that science has any qualms is because for some reason, which of course is a historical question, when people say, oh, he's sick in the head, they actually believe it and then call for a doctor. And then the right. doctor cuts out part of his brain or puts him in a cage indefinitely. Okay. Yeah. It, 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 so it's like, Maybe a good way to square this out would be that there that it's fine to use things in a metaphoric sense mm -hmm. if you know exactly what you're meaning. But the problem is that people are saying that you're mentally ill and literally treating it as a medical yes. uh, problem that we need a doctor. In the same way that someone – like when someone was says, oh, the world's sick right now um, – you know, we, like we would, we would, we would say that that's fine as a metaphor. Yeah. But if you started like literally grabbing a stethoscope and started to like examine like the heart of the earth, or or try to actually like physically like getting a bunch of doctors to you know quote unquote cure the earth. Yeah. Like we we would have a problem with that, you know. And I've got an even better example. The way mm -hmm. we treat this is, of course, a says moment. I'm, I'm yeah. just, just throwing no all of what he says <laughs> yeah, into yeah. this into this. Um, if the way we treat mental illness as a society today, and also mm -hmm. on an individual basis, is very similar to if we are watching a football game. I actually, this example I really like. Um, mm -hmm. We're watching a football game, and there's the star player, and he gets two, three, four, five touchdowns in football. And then your friend next to you says, man, he's on fire. And you go, 
he's on fire and you run onto the field mm-hmm. with a fire extinguisher and you start spraying him with the fire extinguisher. Right. That is quite literally how we treat how mental Ill- that is the same relationship that mental illness that society and and sort of medicine writ large has with right. mental ill mentally ill people um, right it is the the literalizing of a metaphor the medicalizing of behavior of action mm-hmm. um and you know particularly interesting about saz is and perhaps another critique is who cares mm-hmm. okay why why does this matter what is the importance it's semantics of this? It's semantics like yeah. is a huge one. It's like yep. New York playing, you know, not to perhaps has to not do himself justice, but he has two separate papers, not not one, but two about the definition of diseases. So mm-hmm. does not um, do himself justice there. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, the, the answer to that is can be seen in the fact that it's a tool of social control. And now now we're really starting to get into the meta narrative of who cares about SAS and why does it matter? And what are the consequences and how does this relate to libertarianism and Austrian econ? Mm-hmm. Right. And um, one thing I did want to get into before that was maybe yeah, sure. um, because I think a lot of the people watching this may have like a really big thought coming in their head. Um, mm-hmm. Like when they hear just the term, the myth of mental illness, that might be just, just for really, really further clarifying and hitting home. SAS isn't saying that, like, let's say we have someone who, um, I don't know, like they, they want to, and, um, and William F. Buckley brings this up in, in his interview. Let's, let's take a man who, um, for, for whatever reason, thinks he can fly, or for, for, for a reason that maybe we don't know, um, decides to start flapping his wings and jumping at the window, right? I um, guess he thinks he can yep. go up. Yes, I remember this. Yeah, right. So, um, when we're saying that mental illness is not a thing, aka he's not mentally ill, mm-hmm. we're not saying that you can't put any value judgments on this personally. You can't, um, you can't say um, we should help this person or we should, um, you know, maybe this person's a little, lo- maybe this person's a little crazy in the same way you might say like a, a Stalinist is crazy. You know, mm-hmm. um, they're thinking things that you know don't are not panning out to reality in the same way that someone writes two plus two equals five you 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 might say they're crazy right yeah um we would only say that they're not it we would only say that their behavior isn't a medical problem but it is or or is not um an ethical moral political problem so sure like so like we're not saying that like you can't say like let's say um let's say i don't know there's um like i'm trying to think of like an example um let, let's say there's let's say there's someone who like is i don't know like a schizo and for whatever reason or for whatever reason um just goes out and starts murdering people right mm-hmm. um we wouldn't be able to say that that person's mentally ill, but it's not saying, oh, well, well, then, then, oh, yeah, the murdering's fine, the guy jumping at the window's fine, the guy, you know, in the loony bin's fine. We would just say that if we're going to critique them or we're going to put any value judgments on it, we should be doing it from a moral and not a medical uh, point of view. Yes, and this gets into... This is an important thing to say. All right. If you are autistic Mm -hmm. and you don't like to be around people and perhaps you um things need to be a particular way Mm -hmm. you know the spoon must always be on the left and if it's on the right you're very upset right Right. it's a good example perhaps um that's valid and when i say valid i mean saz is going to say that's happening to you that's very real there's nothing fake about it it's not a myth in that sense right Mm -hmm. You're not crazy. You're not delusional. It's not happening. You're suffering. You are truly suffering. You're not. De- I mean, he's not denying that you suffer, and he's not denying that people should get help, and he's not denying that we should treat these people as people who should get help. He's not even saying. Right, Saz is very in favor of therapy. He did spent mm-hmm. his whole life doing therapy, and he spent his whole life trying to um, broaden the scope of what we think therapy should be. We think of therapy mm-hmm. as specific scientific methods upon which 
uh, qualified individual speaks to you about. If you go to therapy, there was back in his day, there was something called scream therapy. Um, mm-hmm. And he commented on it and says, um, scream therapy is as valid as psychoanalysis. If you go to the scream therapist and you scream for 10 minutes and you feel better, that's just as good as therapy as sitting, you know, facing the wall away from the psychoanalyst talking about your right. feelings and your childhood. Yeah. And he says, let them scream, right? Whatever works mm-hmm. for you. That's what therapy is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's a great view because it opens up, it, it eliminates this notion that, first of all, it eliminates this effective monopoly that psychiatrists have. Um, mm-hmm. But it also might open up some uh, very, you know, big treatments uh, for people. 30, 40, 35, 40% of people who have depression are quote unquote depression resistant or treatment resistant. <laughs> Uh, tr- mm-hmm. I'm serious. Treatment like there's treatment resistant depression. Okay, whatever that means. Presumably, it's about drugs. Maybe sure. they're not screaming. Could you help one of those people by screaming? Maybe I don't know, but we got to try it. You know, this is kind of the free market method as well. Mm-hmm. Um, got to try it. Can't just like cord it off and say no, no. Um, right. But anyway, so what he's saying is, is valid. Is that you're valid and your feelings are valid. Um, but what he's not so okay with is having because it's not people that chiefly treat it as um a medical malady or medical malformation it's Mm -hmm. doctors and uh the state and Mm -hmm. uh society perhaps that does it because of a specific history um and you will find actually that when you when I first learned about that, you know, I had quote unquote generalized dis- anxiety disorder mm-hmm. and I s- still take Prozac for it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's fine. Of course, you know, SAS is very in favor of, of if you want, yeah, don't not take your meds, whatever, you know, um, right. you know, you can depend on the efficacy of certain drugs and that's fine. But if you take your drugs and it makes you feel better, SAS is not saying don't take your drugs. And he's not saying go, he's not like, uh, other sort of anti-psychiatry. He actually detested the quote-unquote movement of anti-psychiatry with people like yeah. Ronald Lang um, mm-hmm. and others who were sort of this like, oh, uh, you know, all, all natural sort of try my method. He says, this right. is just another area. This is just putting it on its head and saying that instead of like, mm-hmm. he's, it's just, it's still working within the paradigm of medicine and it's problematic. Um, so he's seeking for a deeper liberation here. Um, and that's, you know, that, that is key, but I was going to say that you will realize, and I think many will realize if they truly accept SAS, when I was learning about SAS and I read this, I got very scared and I got very scared because, well, that means that when I'm too afraid to do a thing, when I'm feeling this intense, intense, anxious, anxious feelings, that's, that, that's my fault. That's because of me. I'm doing that to myself. And I took a lot of reflection on myself and I realized, yes, when I, I, you know, for example, and I no longer, but I used to be terrified of flying, mm-hmm. right? Like terrified, like mm-hmm. beyond terrified. And I thought to myself, am I doing this to myself? I thought I was just afraid of planes. No, I'm not like, or I'm sorry. I thought that there was. Like this, this fear, it's this anxious, this is not within me. It's not under my control. It is under your control. It's all, it's all under your control. It just takes mm-hmm. effort. And you know, when I can't, yeah. that doesn't mean that I'm perfect. And I, I, I do, you know, just this last week, it was finals week or midterms week. And I uh, ordered out more times than I should have. Mm-hmm. And there was a brief thought in my head. And I said to myself, man, I cannot control myself. What are you talking about? It's a deliberate process. You pick up the phone, you call them. It's a series of ordered actions. It's all in your control. So I said to myself, no, it's not that I couldn't. I just, I was, I fell to my impulses. I chose to do this. And that mm-hmm. is the same, but sometimes that choice is covered up. And it does not, and the, the sooner we get to recognizing that it's our choice to act in a particular way and uncover the layers because there's already a bunch of layers covering it. I mean, imagine you are schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to take a lot of unpacking. And it does not help that we have this extra sort of, I don't even want to call it a layer, more like a steel barricade 
of medicalization that society places over it. So we can't even begin to parse through it because it's not even seen as valid, mm -hmm. right? Um, and of course, this differs depending on your mental illness. ADHD, depression, anxiety differs, right? That's going to be treated mm -hmm. more on the line of something you have control over. But again, psychiatry plays both sides of the cards and says, yes, you have control over it. Yes, you have this ability to change it. But here is more drugs than, gosh, you can imagine to treat right. the actual problem, mm -hmm. right? So they hit you with the dual pocket, right? They treat you as though you have no disease and you are totally in your control and they charge you money for that mm -hmm. in therapy. And then they go around and they treat you like you have no free will and it's all in your out of your control and it's all a medical problem and they charge you for that. Right. If you have a psychologist, I guarantee you they are either your psychiatrist or have gotten you a psychiatrist effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that's that dual. It plays both sides of the card. Right. It, it picks your pie. There's a famous Rothbard quote. It says the, the bipartisanship deals are when they pick your pocket in tandem. Um, that's kind mm -hmm. of what this is. Uh, just it's a good Rothbard impression, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but that's 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 kind of what this is as well. I uh, see. So, so this actually might be a really good transition to get into. Um, okay, so you know, for anyone watching previously that might also happen to be an Austrian or libertarian or be within like Austria Lib circles, um, how exactly how exactly does all this tie into um, sort of our understanding of the state, um, the state's organizational interests, um, how the state controls people ethically on an ethical level? Um, but also just on an organizational level. And then in addition to how it also can tie into um, like what we understand about um, like an, from an Austrian perspective of human action and economies. Repeat the first part of it. I tuned out for a sec because I was. So, 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 so basically sir. just so, so basically just for like for Austro libertarians specifically, how does this tie into. Uh, yes. um, right. Well, here is sort of the interesting part. So when I was first discovering Austrian economics, I mm. was kind of like, who the hell cares about economics? This is a classroom subject. This is right. silly, for mm -hmm. one. And for two, like, okay, economics is important. And mm -hmm. economics is cool. But it's not, like, that important, right? It's like, yeah, it's important to the economy and to politics. But it's not, like, going to change my life. That's untrue. Right. So we mm -hmm. Austrian economists realize that economics is everything. It bottoms right. it, like it is as a, it is like a step up, right? Just like one step away from philosophy as a subject in terms of its importance. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people think like politics is where this all bottoms out or maybe sociology or history. No, it bottoms out in economics. And we all know this. Yeah. Uh, and at least in terms of describe descriptive knowledge maybe not prescriptive knowledge it would bottom out in philosophy specifically ethics um mm -hmm. and when someone realizes the importance that praxeology has on not just economics but also on like metaphysical and philosophical implications how mm -hmm. praxeology describes exchange and theft and all of these different facets and creates this whole new worldview around economics mm -hmm. it has the central point economics is not the quote-unquote right dismal science as mises quotes like 10 trillion times it <laughs> is like it is human action it is the study of human action and that is so much broader and so much more fundamental right and that new perspective is amazing psychiatry is much the same I went into psych and I was like, okay, psychiatry, really? That's like, okay, what the hell? Like, who cares about that? Like, sure, it's important for people who have mental illness or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, psychiatry, just like economics, is everything. And when right. I say that, I mean, it is not this just like little thing. Psychiatry is the main form of social control that the government employs on us it used to be there's a reason that psychiatry is paralleled 
by the downfall of religion because that used to be Saz calls psychiatry the religion of the formerly irreligious, right? Hmm. Psychiatry is the new religion because prior to psychiatry and the modern state, religion is what controlled your actions. If you were, you were, there was no deviance, there was no mental illness, you were a sinner or possessed or speaking in uh, tongue. Well, I guess speaking in tongues, not so, but you were possessed or the demon has gotten a hold of you mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Right. So those people, we don't even know the amount of historical accounts of people who probably today would have been diagnosed with autism or schizophrenia or delusion uh, because they were just killed for being sinners. Um, you know, not to mention that we have seen. So there's been a huge shift out of of, of religious behavior. Of course, some of it still maintains. Um, like if you were delusional and say, oh, you know, the sky is whatever, you're going to be killed. Back then, they're mm -hmm. going to kill you for being a sinner or possessed. The idea yeah. of possession and witchcraft and alchemy, right, very similar to how these, pe these people are acting. They were just killed back then and treated as sinners. And today we don't treat that. Sad parallels, right? Um, he actually says that um, today in society, we don't have evil. Back then, if you were crazy, you might be evil. You were a sinner. There was good mm -hmm. and evil, and God was good, and the devil was evil. Um, but today, there is, we actually, when we call someone mentally ill or abnormal mentally, mm -hmm. we actually, we're doing something worse than calling them evil. He gives the example of a man who went around in the 1970s and he just hopped the White House fence and he just shot at the White House with a gun. He just started shooting mm -hmm. him, right? Do you have any doubt that he was seen by a psychiatrist? within the next 24, 48 hours? Of course not. Of course he was, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the presumption is he would not have done anything wrong unless there was something wrong with him. It's not that right. he had a political goal, right? God forbid, mm -hmm. who wants who wants to go and shoot at the White House, right? We can't have people thinking that that's like a thing that quote unquote people do. No, this mm -hmm. is not a person. When we call someone mentally ill, we deprive them of their goal structure. We say mm -hmm. he is not a political agent, but a hunk of meat. Right. There right. is there is nothing there effectively. Mm -hmm. So Sash says there is no evil. We don't have evil anymore. We have normal people and we have abnormal people. And normal people are good and abnormal people aren't people. They have no they don't have the capacity to do goal structures mm -hmm. to, to enter into that realm of 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 being a moral agent. You're kind of like a monkey. You're kind of like yeah. an ape. You just don't, yeah. you're like, you're, you're succumb to your impulses, right? Monkeys can't be good or bad, right? We don't think, at least generally, we don't think that. Um, but so that's the, getting back to the main point, that's kind of the importance that this all has on our lives today. And increasingly, as religion continues to decline, there must be a new social regulator. There must be something which regulates our behavior. And of course, back then they used religion. Was of course used by the state. Not only was it used by the state, oftentimes it just was the state. So there was no mm -hmm. need for a faction of religious social control. It just was part of everyone's life. Um, but today, of course, we have the AMA and the APA and, uh, and all sorts of other institutions. The N, uh, NIH. Uh, Sass hates the NIH so much more. It's just hilarious. Um, <laughs> but. Um, these are the tools of social control. And you may ask, well, that seems like a really weird tool of social control. Um, but that's because you're, you're, you're stuck in this mindset that um, mental illnesses aren't like tools of social control. They're just like diseases. You have to get out of that. You have to look mm -hmm. behind the curtain and see what are these behaviors and why would the state want to discourage them? Well, some of them are very simple. If you're schizophrenic, you know what you're not doing is working. For mm -hmm. sure, you're not working, right? right? Yeah. Now, a lot of that does come down to this as well. Saz quotes George Bernard Shaw, um, very famously, George Bernard Shaw said, every institution is a conspiracy against the public. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Very, very powerful quote, I think. Kind of left-pilled. Not a huge issue with that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the, you know, the, the Saz's relation with the left, specifically the anti-psychiatry left like Foucault is it, it's a, a very strong link even mm -hmm. though the two had never uh, met or debated or talked about each other more than in passing 
Uh, well, I think uh, well, I think Saz specifically was inspired by Foucault's book. Um, fuck, what was it? Um, Birth Madness of the and Civilization. Yeah, yeah, Madness and Civilization. That book. I'm pretty sure, right? No. Really? Well, like, they came like, out was, around was, the was, same was time. Saz, was Saz not influenced by Foucault's work? I thought he was. As far as I can tell, no, because their systems are from mm. one different. Uh, mm. Foucault goes at it at a very different route than Saz does, although they come to the same conclusions. Actually, mm. I would even say they don't come to the same conclusions because Foucault speaks really nothing of, of category error. I would say Saz was influenced much more by Gilbert Ryle. The other thing mm. is the issue of time. Um, Foucault published his book, Madison Civilization, in 1960. Oh. Saz was already writing about this okay, stuff huh, in the 50s. Huh, I thought, okay, I, for some reason I thought Madness and Civilization came even earlier. but I can check right now. Madness mm. and Civilization was originally published in 61. I was wrong. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And I, there are. Yeah, so I, Myth of Mental Illness came out before then, huh? So, well, yes. Yeah, because yeah. it seems like Foucault is like much more of a yeah, and that would make sense too that Saz wouldn't be influenced by Foucault. I guess that does make a lot more sense because Foucault was more of a historian. He 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 has a lot more of a like a historical analysis than like I think Saz does. I mean, although I I know you have touched upon Saz's like mm -hmm. historical analysis as well as well. Madison Civilization is a very good book for historical analysis, um, and Saz got better at writing when he got older i hate to say mm -hmm. it but his like stuff from like 55 to 63 kind of sucked in terms of its writing it was kind of really dense and irritating to read i um, see but foucault was a really good writer at the time mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't think there's a huge you know the conflict is their political structure is not so much the system itself mm -hmm. um but I, yeah i think that um I, I did correct. want to touch upon that one quote that you mentioned. Um, what was it again? All organizations are what? Oh, all institutions are a conspiracy against the public. I would argue, I think it would actually be more arg accurate to argue that institutions, because I don't, because here's the thing, because I, I, I think I talked with Vince about this a, bit, a while ago, and we were debating on um, sort of the problem with my characterization of institutions having goals. Um, I think it would be more accurate to say that that all institutions have necessary functions and ten, uh, tenants that are required in order to sustain them. If that makes sense. Um, sure. So, like, because well, I think I think his ground would more be like that. I think he think, or or some people that I talk to, as though I'm treating institutions like the state, for instance, or a a private firm. As though it, it's like a praxeological agent, whereas I think I would argue that um, it's not really that the, the institutions themselves are actual people and they have goals. I think, but I think it would be more accurate to argue that in order for institutions to survive, they need things to sustain themselves. So, for instance, like by definition, for instance, the state needs definitionally um, to coerce people through a tax uh, to through setting up a taxation scheme for mm -hmm. instance right um so we can we could argue that the state essentially has a you know a goal in in finger quotes or a an incentive or a whatever you want to call it um to tax its public okay and what what do states need to tax well what are what are some institutions that the state may have an incentive to set up which would make it easier for them to tax a greater number of people and collect more income. Well, you know, central banking is a very great, great mechanism. Um, the centralization of firms, you know, like into Fortune 500 firms. Um, this is why I've like argued that like monopolization is a really great way for the state to um, tax people because essentially, um, if you have like only 500 institutions or like you know very centralized institutions that um, can be very easily monitored. Um, be very easily tracked, be essentially just directly connected with the state. Um, th the state doesn't have to spend as much resources in order to actually collect its taxes because essentially um, you're already under the thumb of government approved institutions anyway. Um, and, and also with banking, because I know that I know that um, like if you um, if, if everyone essentially is um, is is essentially forced to um, to be connected with a state a state-run banking institution then if you're not paying your taxes it's a very easy way for the state to just use use 
that as leverage against you and just shut down your account. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that's yeah, kind of I don't rambling, uh, but, strictly yeah. agree with his, um, with what he says about George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the point that he's trying to make is that when he says that all professions or institutions are a conspiracy against the public, he really sort of means something along the lines of um, that people, that it has to do with the way in which institutions kind of acquire prestige. Um, right. And I don't think it's true for all things, but he, Bernard Shaw would argue that there's sort of an inherent conflict. Of course, we know praxeologically this is not the case, but for governments, because psychiatry, Sands would argue, and I also would argue, is a, is a, um, a wing of the state. Uh, medicine right. largely is too now. Um, and that is the, the problem, <laughs> is, is that it's not a free, because if it was under the, if it was, you know, if it was in the realm of the free market, then it could, you know, people could, there would honestly be a very large, I would love to see this, you know, if the state disappeared, this battle of ideas that would probably have to take place. Um, right. The, you know, you'd have slandering like a billboard that says like myth of mental illness or something like that. I don't know. But sure. Um, but yeah, so I agree with you. I, it's just a point that says kind of brings up a lot when he's trying to demonstrate this idea of how, psychiatry sort of acquires its legitimacy and it acquires its legitimacy mm -hmm. illegitimately by trying to um effectively pull a fast one on people by mm -hmm. by outsourcing itself to something which is unquestioned and at the time of its outsourcing remained unquestioned that is medicine um, cuz who is going to question your doctor when he tells you that you have a, something wrong with your brain um, right so that's but that's really all he's effectively trying to do when he says that um and it's a very sort of important little like um like a sazism if you will kind of like a bushism he's got a lot of those mm -hmm. um so yeah um i don't remember where exactly we were going with this um, well okay so so sorry i mean we did kind of get a little bit derailed but we were yeah. just going to tie it into specifically again we, we were trying to tie it into um Libertar like libertarianism and the Austrian method yeah. kind of ties into those um, well, things I think that, we're, that, that we're a bit more familiar with. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, that is sort of the parallel. Because um, Sands kind of functions, I tried to write an article on this once, and then it kind of was like, eh, this is a little bit too much for me. Um, mm -hmm. But I tried to basically say that Sands is like Mises in, uh, Sands is the Mises of psychiatry. Do you get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, well, I think I think Saz would. Um, I don't know if he explicitly considered himself a praxeologist, but I I don't know he if he would not. agree that he huh. He did not like praxeology or Mises too well. He didn't like praxeology. That's very interesting. No, to me. he argued prax or he uh he argued that praxeology, uh you know we can't all be perfect. Um, he argued praxeology was um. Well, first of all, he. Mises made some views about insane people. He had a field day with that. You know, he was not right. too happy with that. Um, but he, he specifically sort of uh, said that uh, praxeology is like, it's not like science, right? It doesn't, like he said here, he said it's not right to call economics a science because science is limited to the things which are completely physical. That was what he said. Um, hmm. I can link the article. Perhaps his lowest moment. I completely disagree with Saz on this point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Needless to say, um, hate to bring it up, um, but yeah. Well, I mean, well, even historically, there's also the problem of well, I think people try to distinguish, and this is what I really loved because I think Mises was the first. Because I've always thought this. I've always, when I was taught this in government schools, I always sort of had this problem where I think people would tell me, um, well. Well, science and philosophy are distinct, right? I mean, and they technically are to some extent, but I think there's the issue of, okay, what even counts as a science in the first place? Well, you need some kind of, you need some kind of methodology, you need some kind of epistemology, you need, you need a lot of philosophic underpinnings, you need a lot of grounding even to, even to argue what counts as a science in the first place, what categories of science applies to. 
um, a, a lot of these other things. And what a, what is interesting about Mises is that Mises is both a philosopher and an economist. He considers, well, I mean, at least to me, it seems like he considers the study of economies to be not only a legitimate science, but grounded in a, a philosophic methodology. I mean, I mean, the first, like, what is it like the first, like, two or three chapters of human action, just philosophy, you know, or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is kind of shocking, you know, for an economics textbook, because most scientists are just saying, well, well, this is kind of what we're assuming about our models. So we're just going to lay it out here. They don't really give the epistemic grounding either. But Mises specifically wants to start at the very beginning. Like, what is what is even the study of economies in the first place? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't say that I really have any disagreements or qualms with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause it's true. You know, says uh, he, uh, he bluffed, he uh, missed the mark with that one um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, wonder what his Wikipedia says on this. Like what well, um, is about... referencing the fact that I alter his Wikipedia. Cause I like, Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> gotcha. I'm going to do this forever. And I'm going to do it until I can make it perfect. Let's and um, uh, the main goal is to remove the criticism part. Um, why would I do this? <laughs> uh, many may ask me, mm -hmm. um, because I'm in the business of rhetorics and propaganda, and there's no room for for holy um, base. Let's go. There's no room for for uh, fairness in that. Uh, mm -hmm. So they're gonna remove. Hey, if anyone has like a lot of cred on Wikipedia, go to Wikipedia, go to Sass's page right now, and just take out the just delete the whole criticism. Because why? I mean, mm -hmm. everyone's got criticisms. I don't know why his are aired. You mm -hmm. know. I if he's got if someone has criticism they can talk to me about it right I'll mm -hmm. I'll I'll address those criticisms I'll give you the papers yeah that's very interesting he didn't yeah he he didn't like praxeology very much because it seems like his arguments like if they're not praxeological in nature it seems like they very much closely fit in with that line well of this reasoning. is what I was going to say is yeah. that in the same sort of way well first of all science is like so to speak heterodox right of course Austrian school is two Mises is two. Uh, but they both sort of like, I think, uh, I wish I was more up to date on my Keynesianism um, so I could make claims about, I think, of category errors within Keynesianism. Um, <laughs> you, but, you know that book? Um, I think I posted this in the Austrian server. It was like, um, it was literally titled the, like the economics of mental retardation. I think I do know that book. Yeah. That's just like, that's just like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is like anytime, anytime I hear Keynesianism brought up, this is this is the first. It's thing the first thing that the funny. first thing that that gets spits out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think like I think the parallel was effectively that. Um, you know what? It's kind of a little bit lost to me. Um, but the the main point is that I they are both sort of like. They they parallel each other as as sort of libertarian thinkers, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. Both his like both the time in history, and then also in um, sort of the place in which they do. But I think mm -hmm. that that's that's a subject that I I it's been a little bit since I've spoken up on. But I do well, want to yeah. Well, go on. one of the things that I did want to mention with that is that the reason why like it kind of struck me as him being a praxeologue is just because he, he had this very interesting line and it made me think a lot more about a little bit more about methodology. And I'm not, and again, I'm not like an expert in either libertarianism as far as the ethical grounding goes mm -hmm. um, or, or even Austrian econ, although I I would consider myself a proponent of both um, or at least as from what I found, I found, I found both methodologies to be um, carry the most explanatory power in the way I try to analyze the world. But um, one of the things that Saz said, it was, it was actually in that um, William F. Buckley interview. Sure. And he said something to the effect of um, we, when we're analyzing someone's behavior, mm -hmm. um, if we see someone engage in an action, um, well, first of all, we know that it's purposeful. I mean, but I, I don't know if he said that exactly, but sure. he said something to the effect of when we see someone engage in an action, um, we can't know what's in his own head we can't we can't know what yes. he like With the exact the man jumping out the window specifically right exactly we, we can't we can't we can never ever ever know exactly 
the context and what he's thinking yeah. because so, we're not the ones thinking it but we can only know what he tells you we can only yes. know his we can only observe that's his our actions clue as they occur that is actually right? all that's like and that case. struck me yeah yeah and that and that struck me as like a very misesian point because mm-hmm. again like I, sorry I'm, I'm kind of blank i'm kind of blanking on how to tie it no specifically into it but like are you seeing kind of like where i'm what i'm getting at no a i do bit? Like, i yeah, do yeah, see yeah. exactly i do see what you mean but i think right. that the says i think it's they both sort of uh, rely on a form of skepticism i suppose you could call it um basically where Rasaz is saying that like how are you able to what are why what, what are these tests that you're taught like okay so this person says that they like like have don't you have like a larger sort of like uh what you might call it um don't you have any more curiosity in you than that it's like oh so it's like this person tries to jump out of windows and flaps his hands Mm -hmm. and you conclude that he of all the possible interpretations you conclude he's trying to fly that's Mm -hmm. your conclusion and you have no that that's it that's your first thing first thing you come to usually wrong is the first thing you come to and then also your last conclusion and mm-hmm. you know there's this idea i don't want to sidetrack but this idea called malingering um and a malingerer is a person who intentionally acts sick to deceive a doctor mm-hmm. um and now malingering is a mental illness and also kind of but back then it was uh it was just a thing you would do you uh, kick the malingerer out of the hospital he uh He's taking up a bed. Now, if you're malingering, you get put in a loony bed or treated with whatever. Um, but um, so he's, so why not, Saz is saying, right? You're exculpating this man from all responsibility and destroying his agency when you think he's a crazy bird who goes fly in the air. Why not? Let's assume that instead of this person having a weird sort of like complexion where he thinks he can fly, what if he's just lying to you because he doesn't want to go to work? What if that is the answer? Or what mm-hmm. if maybe he's not lying? Maybe he doesn't want to fly either. Maybe he thinks he's in a vi- in a in a in a thick viscous fluid, and he can mm-hmm. sort of crawl his way around. Or maybe he wants to kill himself. Maybe that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Whatever it may be, right? We don't know. But you know, part of the important part is that we, you know, Saz still does make assumptions because the process of of therapy, I suppose you might call it, uh, is that like you have the therapist has to sort of try to get a quote unquote inside the person's head, um, mm-hmm. and of course that was Saz's job. So he tried, you know, it's specific, very famously, um, as far as famous Saz things go, um, when he was doing a um, in this William F. Buckley thing, he says, um, "Let me talk to the person. You know, I need to speak to the. I can't make these things without speaking to the person." Mm-hmm. Um, I can't make conclusions by speaking to the person. And then this leads me to sort of ask people a specific question. Um, have you ever been arguing with someone and they say a thing and you get down, you really get down to the root of an argument, right? You're done with all the hocus pocus. Let's say you're doing abortion. Mm-hmm. And instead of talking about like Roe v. Wade, you're like at the heart of like, okay, what makes a person a person or something like that, you know? And, you know, maybe it bottoms out at an opinion. It most likely does, as most things do, sort of unfortunately. But you just can't seem to wrap your head around how this person can think that way. But you can still accept that they do. Like, mm-hmm. for example, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, chocolate, probably. Okay, mine's not chocolate. Okay. Yeah. I don't understand. I can't wrap my head around what it's like to believe, to feel that chocolate is my favorite thing in the whole mm-hmm. world. Do you, for example, um, do you like, do you uh, smoke weed? Uh, no. Okay. So I can't really wrap my head around what it's like to n- believe that I don't smoke weed. Like, let's say you believe it. I'm not saying this is the case, but let's say you think it's wrong. Right. Right. And I'm like, well, why? And we eventually bought them out after 10,000 whys. And you say, I just, yeah, I don't like it. I think it's wrong. <laughs> I don't like it. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I can't wrap my head around that. I can't understand. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And you just keep repeating, oh, I just think it's wrong. Uh, unfortunately, that's how morality kind of functions, you know, especially if you're a moral subjectivist. Um, right. I am. But um, that's how it's that's how it works. Um, so why is that different from a man who says, it's like, well, why do you think you can fly? Why do you, what do you mean? 
I just I like can't, I, like I just think I can. But we consider that person absurd and crazy, and this other person is just someone we disagree with. In fact, even though we disagree with him, we can still understand and kind of get a sense of what it must be like. But I think people, I'm going to be honest, I think people like don't give these like insane people a chance. Um, there are there's this man, his name's Danny DeSoul, um, and he was called one of the mad ones. And his entire practice uh, was to take these like insane people. And get mm-hmm. them functioning, right? He took them off all their meds, and all he did was just get them functioning, right? He mm-hmm. taught them how to collect their social security. He taught them how to pay their taxes. He taught them how to get a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took years and years of effort, but it worked with no meds. Um, and the point is because he, Danny DeSoul, listened, right? He actually listened to what they were saying and bought into their system. You know, when someone says, well, don't you realize that the aliens are going to come down and kill all of us? And that means we mm-hmm. have to, we have to burn the corn. We have to do it. Cause if we don't burn the corn, the aliens are going to come down and they're going to kill our children. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, people hear that and they go crazy, but why is that different than when you tell a Democrat well, of course, there shouldn't be any government. Mm-hmm. We can't, of course, there can't be any government because taxation is theft. That sounds perhaps as similarly crazy as, you know, right? the aliens are going to come down. We got to burn the corn. Right. Right. But with one, we entertain it. The other one, we don't. And you're maybe thinking, well, how the hell could that make any sense? I don't know. How long did it take you to go from whatever you weren't to libertarian? It took me about a year. So... That's how um, long it took to understand it. It took me well. It took me longer because I so I started off as a conservative, um, and it was mainly because I got my start. Like I think a lot of us here did, depending on how old you are. Sure, I um, did. Yeah. In in sort of the um in sort of the rise of Trump and the sort of reaction to it, um, basically basically the rise of Trump spawned sort of the SJW movement, and then also it also spawned um and then from there it also spawned a reaction of anti-feminists and people critiquing them so it it spawned a rise of trump fans and then also just general conservatives um and that kind of sprawled into the alt-right as well um well even though the alt-right was sort of already its movement and then that also sparked a backlash from um basically what we now recognize as bread to so people like vosh or you know even destiny to some extent Um, and, and a bunch of other leftist content creators. So it, it essentially just made everyone even more crazy with, re- with, with regards to politics. And it made a lot of people my age a lot more invested in it. So I was like a – so for like a long a long time, basically from middle school – or no, no, not, 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 not middle school. Um, probably like early high school, freshman or sophomore year, it's politically conservative. And then basically just throughout high school, I'd argue, like th- from freshman year – to probably around like maybe maybe senior year it was around it was basically when i turned 18 and i'm 21 now so um so i've I've been an anarchist for almost three years um and and before that for about four years or so four or five i was a conservative basically yeah well i i just yeah i mean i my point is is that you expect to understand these people and the claims yeah. they're making in what mm-hmm. a day? They're right right now. Right. Try a yeah. year, buddy. Yeah. Right. I mean, if it takes you this long, some people never understand it. Some people actually, and that's fine too. You don't have to. I mean, like, mm-hmm. let's say they say the aliens at the corn. Okay, you don't understand it. Okay, well, <laughs> fucking, I don't understand a lot. Right. Like, some many right. people will, no matter how much you sit them through it, and they even if they fucking want to learn, they mm-hmm. just can't seem to figure out what the hell is this like anarchism shit? Like, what the, what is right. that even about? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting too is that you could you could almost apply it to almost any crazy weird belief system. Like, like a uh, flat earthers would be a really great example of this. Yes. Or Scientology. Perfect Scientologists. Example. Yeah, I don't right? fucking understand. Like, I can understand it. You know. Well, like, like here's the thing, like. Like, why would we claim, for instance, um, a man who like literally believes like aliens are among us? They're secretly here. They're, you know, they're again. Like, are are you familiar with uh, Francis E. Deck at all? I'm not. Okay, so he was this absolutely fucking batshit crazy person um, who um, 
who is who essentially thought that it, it's very complicated, but he believed in this grand conspiracy um, that the government was run by this alien um, gangster communist computer god that uh-huh. wanted to put put brain chips in everyone and um basically he thought that like everything was a psyop so there's this famous like letter that he wrote to a, a judge where he he was describing like a plane trip that he went on basically thinking that like the plane is secretly like a cia plot to kill him because he's essentially like the only one on earth who knows that this is like the plot from the uh, gangster computer god who's controlling everything sure it's really batshit crazy but it's really funny as well Sure. Um, I'll send you, I'll send you a link of um, uh, to some of his letters, but essentially, like, like why would we would we claim that guy's mentally ill? But what about a flat earther? You know, like, where, where, at what point of craziness in your beliefs do we draw the line? You know. Yeah. Now here's part of the thing, right? So let's tie this back for a second. Sure. What the hell is it? like? I was talking earlier about how, um, and I just want to actually end before I say this on one other note. Um, understanding what these people are saying Mm -hmm. or I should say failing to is no different than failing to understand what a flat earther is saying or what a Marxist is saying. Just because you don't get it doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It doesn't mean it's true. You you don't. What if it is true? What? How are you going to feel when you're not burning your corn and the alien does come down? What are you going to? You're going to feel like a fucking idiot. Is what you're going to feel like. Right. That's my point. Anyway, um, of course, although the main point, of course, was that is that people don't even take a second to try to understand what they're saying. They just dismiss it. Um, And that's harmful because then you can't understand why they're thinking it. And once you figure out why they're thinking it, you realize it's a pretty rational process, right? It's just maybe an awry assumption. Gee, that happens all the time in philosophy and politics. It's just one Mm -hmm. false assumption. Um, Yeah, I I mean, or that like um you, you could you could say for instance that um like you don't like you don't understand why they believe it but like you can you could say for instance if someone is going to like try to walk on water for instance that no you can't like walk on water you're obviously going to fall into the ocean and we and so i have my chain of reasoning that leads me to conclude and disagree with your assumption that you're going to be able to walk on water but there is some thought process there. There is some reason why you came to that conclusion. Maybe your assumptions are just completely way off, and and maybe I'm way off. But mm-hmm. so like you can still disagree with people on the grounds that like they're wrong for thinking that they can fly, or they're wrong for thinking that the Earth is flat, or they're wrong yeah. for thinking that the aliens are there. But again, to tie it back to the to what Saz's point would be is that it's wrong to say that's a medical issue. It's even wrong to say it's a thought, a, a disorder of the thought. Yeah. Because you would say, this is this is a joke that I like to say. People will say, you have an eating disorder. I don't know what you're talking My eating is very ordered. It's right. very well structured. Yeah. Well, you say your thought is disordered. No, it's a very elaborate pro- I mean, have you read Dianetics? You know, have you read mm-hmm. uh, 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 what is it? Um, I've, a lot of a lot of things people will say oh you know oh that's disordered thinking you have a mental disorder what do you mean mental disorder this process about the aliens coming to burn the corn right that's mm-hmm. not disordered that's very structured um mm-hmm. so it's it's a misnomer it's a misnomer to call any of this disordered it's more like you disagree with the order that's where the dis comes from i yeah, disagree exactly. with the order yeah exactly exactly um, anyways um but i think that is um, I was going to tie it back into this sort of political process because mental people will say to me, this is a, a higher class objection, I would say. Mm-hmm. Maybe a tier two objection. Is that people would say, okay, well, I get the political thing, Dan. I get that you know, the, the psychiatry has these specific uh, diseases because they are politically advantageous or advantageous to it or they knock out some sort of socially deviant behavior. Mm-hmm. What is like the incentive for this? It's like, well, this person who does the corn maybe isn't very harmful. Uh, maybe they're not harmful. Maybe they are harmful. What is true is that a lot of these people, according to the state, have so. Well, I, I should rephrase. This person who is talking about the corn is not in the same class as the man who immolated himself in front of the Israeli embassy not too long ago, or right. who 
shot at the White House. Or when I was uh, a kid, I remember there was this guy dressed up like uh, Ash from Pikachu from Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Ash from Pikachu. I'm going to get flipped. Yeah. Um, and sat, he just jumped the White House fence and just sat there. Mm-hmm. Right? There's a different class of person because this person isn't making an overt political act. Um, but the state might still have an interest in securing it. Um, or or uh, I should say, either the state has an interest in um, deterring such behavior, aka eliminating it from existing by calling it a mental illness, or it's just a product of, remember that over-inclusive definition? They're not perfect either. Like, mm-hmm. no one's going to give a shit if you call this crazy person who is in delusion and, you know, whatever, whatever, if you if you make this guy, if you call this guy schizophrenic and dehumanize him, right? They might have an issue when it's a political thing, but this other guy, it's like, if we need to over-include a little bit of these people, that's okay too. Um, I don't necessarily know which one it is, I don't think it really matters, honestly, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it all ties back into a sort of political process. And I think we could go through each disease, honestly. Um, I've done this before. There are some pretty crazy diseases in the DSM-5. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. Like, there's one about having too much sex, and then not having enough sex. And then, you know, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you work too hard, you don't work enough. It's like, when you really look at it, it's like, Gosh, you can tell. And everyone always goes straight to the extreme with schizophrenia or um, the real the real tough one is like Tourette syndrome. That's a toughie. Um, uh, really interesting. PTSD is also tough too. And um, those are the those are those are toughies, um, which I can talk about if, if we want. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's let's just like get rid of the toughies. Okay. Well, that still leaves most mental illnesses as like pretty evidently tools like trying to control social behavior. Mm-hmm. ADHD is the fucking easiest one. Yeah. Why? Okay, ADHD. First of all, pay attention. Okay, yeah. you don't like you don't like doing things? You don't like to pay attention to things? Okay. I also don't. I also have trouble focusing. Mm-hmm. But perhaps you need to learn new habits or develop. There's a reason it's in kids mostly. Mm-hmm. Right? What about what am I going to I don't know what to say to that one. Depression and anxiety are the same thing, too. Also, very clear political goals. Depressed people don't work, don't make good fighters, right? Mm -hmm. Same with anxious people. ADHD Mm -hmm. people can't follow their orders, right? Don't don't put them in the military, right? Whatever, whatever. Um, Might come to backfire them when they have most of their population claiming that they're mentally ill. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Who knows? I guarantee you, if we get into a real conflict, those requirements will be dropped. They will include them. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. You're gonna. You doesn't. You're schizophrenic. More like you're on the front lines at schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You're you're yeah. coming to Korea or wherever the fuck they want you to. And go. that's something that I've argued for a while too. Is that like I don't think I think it's very silly, especially if you're a libertarian. Like you should know this. Just just knowing what the state is, who these people are. Um, like I don't think they lock up people. Um. Put, like e- even actual criminals, even people that we would agree are on like the same tier as the state. I mean, maybe even less, just because like you know, the state kills millions. Maybe a, cri- a petty criminal can at most kill like fifty, but sure. e- even so, they're still awful, right? Um, like I don't think the state puts them behind bars, and in the same way, like they you know they help depressed people because you know help in quotation marks. Obviously, I don't think they do that because oh, they actually want to keep us safe. They actually care about this. If, if, it requi- if it required to, like, just systematically murder people, you know, mm-hmm. um, murder murder hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in order for the state to continue living, they would totally do it. And have it, well, yeah. <laughs> they, they're currently doing it, you yeah. know, like, they're right? Um, that's the entire fucking point of war, you know? So I... I I think I think they mainly do it just because if if they have just random people killing each other just randomly, it, it's an anarchy in the bad sense. Um, they can't really maintain a political economy. They can't maintain a functioning society. They can't even ma- they wouldn't be able to maintain themselves very well as states. So they Correct. essentially need a police force to crack down on the real crimes, but then also crack down on basically any other crime that isn't well, actually state. Possible. The state is God. They need to be God. I mean, there's a re like sure. they Bro, the there's contract. there's yeah there's no there's no the getting around it. pay to live in a civil. You know, actually, it's funny how you mentioned that transition between um, 
like the religious just- justification for controlling people versus the now secularized version of controlling people. And I've argued this before. I think I think Esso's argued this actually is that um, essentially what happened was is that at the turn of the Enlightenment, um, the shift from a divine right of kings theory, the religious justification for the state, essentially, whether this was intentional or not, um, I think is a bit left up to the air. Um, but that that divine right of kings theory justification for the state essentially turned into a secular secularized version of it where you treat the social contract as God. I mean, if you even look at like what the social contract even is on its face, this idea that like we all just secretly consented, you know, like yeah. that is almost a relig- that is basically a religious viewpoint. You know, I think sure. um, like filthy heretic has said something to the effect of like, you know, statism is a religion. And that's effectively like why. Um, sort of the early libertarians of the 19th century um, came up with the phrase, you know, no God, no masters, essentially, yeah. because they essentially viewed both things as a tool of uh, propaganda and social control. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing about psychiatry, though, is that it is also um, it's a it's a tool of social a good so a tool of social control never reveals his, his himself to. Mm-hmm. To the masses because then it's pretty ineffectual if you right. you know because how how can how can psychiatry dictate your control how can psychiatry put limits on what is acceptable behavior not only accepted because i was actually going to talk about this when we were talking about locking people up uh mm-hmm. the way psychiatry has sort of uh um drawn back from its intensity lessened its intensity but broadened its scope to compensate for it Primarily right. in the sense of we don't have as many people committed civilly, though never forget it is you are two or four signatures, depending on your state, a physician, a psychiatrist, and a psychologist, sometimes two physicians, maybe a judge, away mm-hmm. from getting put indefinitely in a mental institution. Now, don't ever forget that. Uh, so it's always the fact that they can do it is kind of like the same way where it's like, um, you know, they can, uh, it's like, Okay, well, if I just you know comply and pay my taxes, then it's like it's chill. But they can still always take you away, right? So it's like, right. And this is you know, Saz will say like, why is there such a high rate of people checking themselves in to mental hospitals? No, oh, because they're not stupid and they know that they're just gonna get brought there anyway. So might as well you know bite the bullet. But that, yeah. you know that's regardless. Um, but um, you know there needs to sort of, they need to sort of the, the it needs to be apparent that this is not like explicitly a tool of social control because that right. sort of it sort of um takes it down a notch it doesn't really work it's kind of like um i'm trying to think of an example but i can't think of a great one but that's okay i think you see what i'm saying right well i mean well sort of in the way that like um that government education it's it's literally treated in the name as oh we're, we're here to educate you that's we're a great to, example we're here to help you right yeah. we're in we're in reality you don't really have a well first of all you don't have a choice to go to government schools first of all then also, in jail. what was what was that first of all we're gonna put you in prison yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah and then of course like what they teach is you know very limited and it's you know politicized and etc but you know yeah i it, it, it's it's much the same as that um yeah and that's, you know, I think the big sort of takeaway is that, and I, I also want to note that Saz can say everything I'm saying so much better. Um, and his contemporaries, you know, I think writing is just the best way to get ideas out there comprehensively. Mm-hmm. I guess, obviously, because you have time to mull it over and work on it. Yeah. Uh, but he writes really well and sort of writes in a way that's profound. Um, I think... Uh, I, I actually want, if you don't mind if I change gears here, um, since it's, uh, what are we at? Oh, we're at two hours now. Jeez. We're at about two hours, yeah. We, we can go a little bit more. I, I, yeah. I mean, we can go for, we can really go for however long you, you feel like. I, okay, I don't really that's really fine. I may be a little so. bit longer. Yeah. Um, but I do want to read something. Okay, um, sure. So this is from his book, The Meaning of Mind. And I just want to, like, I just want to show you exactly what I mean by the profundity of which he writes. Okay, um, sure. So this is just a paragraph. So he says, as I noted in the preface, prior to the 16th century, the English word for mind functioned only as a verb, meaning to mind or he minded, as an example. There was then no English word for mind as noun, just as there still is no German or French word for it. 
In modern English, countless words, for example, bug, drug, hug, mug, function as both verb and noun. The verb refers to what the person does, the noun to an event or object outside the self. Because nouns such as bug or hug name real objects or events, we understand that bugging a person means annoying him, and that hugging him means giving him a hug. And we miss, and because the noun mind names a fictitious object, we misunderstand minding as our mind. But we have no minds. Instead, we qua living persons mind. How and what we mind is who we are. Minding is quintessentially our own business. The greatest indignity a person can inflict on another is to treat him as if he could not mind. That mm -hmm. is, as if he had no mind, quote, of his own, and hence his mind slash minding was no longer his business. Similarly, the greatest injury a person can inflict on himself is to treat his mind as if its business were not worth minding. That is, as it were, as if it were no longer his, and hence perceive his own actions as the result of the minding of others. So this is one of the most important points because this gets into the metaphysics of Saz, uh, specifically to what, you know, there's different interpretations, but Saz himself, it was not a dualist because right there and then he says, we have no mind. This is a common mm -hmm. accusation. People say, well, of course, Saz was a dualist. He does the category error. No, 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 no. No, that's not, A, it's not really what a category or is a uh, simpliciter. And B, that's not what he says in the book, in any of his books. So when he says we have no mind, he means that there is no entity which we have mind. This is a proper, this is this is the uh, consequence of the awry metaphysics of people like, I don't know, Daniel Dennett or whoever, who are like, you know, the brain is the hardware and the, you know, the mind is the software. What the hell are you talking about? Saz actually says that the same way we think of mind to brain is both the same way and how it should be treated, right? The same way that people used to treat the soul and the, the chest, the, the sternum midriff. People used to think that the soul was actually inside of the midriff and they would cut people open to look for it. Hmm. Just as psychiatrists have cut open people's brains to look for it. Why the hell? Right. Okay. So maybe is there an association? Maybe, maybe there's an association. Um, I would argue that there is some sure association between mind and brain, but certainly no nothing as crazy as the mind is inside of the brain because there is no entity which we call mind. Mind is just the amalgamation of internal dialogue, self conversation, actions, behavior, and thoughts that we colloquially refer to as. Um, an entity, uh, an entity which someone has, because we right. have, again, this is a metaphor literalization, right? Like he right. has a mind of his own. Wow, you know what I mean? And yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't want to get too off in the language route, but I mm -hmm. actually wrote a paper on this recently. Um, you know, the idea of sort of linguistic influence or linguistic determinism. There, I don't know if you do you know what the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is. Um, I'm not familiar. So it's a it's a two guys Edward Sapir and Benjamin Worf in the early 1920s 30s 40s specifically Benjamin Worf um, I guess the followers are a better example because it's a specific one they did is they took people who have in English we have a demarcator between green and blue uh, we we those are different colors to us we have different words for them mm -hmm. and he took uh, they they these two people Kay and Kempton took those people and they took people from the Tarahumara language. Um, somewhere in the India subcontinent region, um, Nepalese, I think, actually. And they don't have a word for green and blue. They just have green, blue, or mm. green or blue. It's one word. And they wanted to measure the difference and how these people perceived one another or how they perceived the colors. Mm -hmm. um, and did they like psychologically think they were further apart? And of course, they concluded yes. Uh, I actually think that study is kind of bogus. But the whole point is that language can have like a very incredible influence, like our day to day right. use of like just just like not even like how we use words, but like what words are there for things. Right. Like in German, they don't have a word for mind. They have a word that means ghost, soul, spirit, geist. Right. Hmm. So they don't, and th therefore their their perception of mental illness is slightly different than ours mm -hmm. um, because without mind and with the discrediting of soul due to a lack of religion, 
for them, they are much more biologically determined in terms of their mental illness than we are. Because we still have, we of course, we are also declining in religion, as is most of the Western world, uh, or rates of religion. But we still have this idea of mind, which is something that we quote have, which is something that is us, so to speak. So we have, we tend, surprisingly, I mean, actually, not surprisingly, but like Western Europe is like worse with mental illness than we are in the U.S. Uh, not in terms of like the scale of it, but it's like if you got it, there is no like agency it's it's completely there is a sort of level of degree here um whereas mm -hmm. in the u.s it's like we still attribute blame to people for adhd and anxiety um just as an example yeah um so yeah that's just what i that's just another uh, uh, an important point about this whole business of, of of metaphysics and language it just goes to show how deep it goes it goes pretty deep um just like with econ um mm -hmm. i was actually going to write something on this about how how does the the public private distinction like tangibly affect us right because mm -hmm. with public and private the word public means both like comes from the word i think it's like publis or polos or something like that mm -hmm. um which means like the people of the populace but then it, now it also means of the government Mm -hmm. Right, and how does that just that simple language change? How does that actually like? And the answer is it affects us a lot, because now you can hide behind saying, "Oh, it's public land," right? Or it's the business mm -hmm. of the public, which you think goes right. people into. I mean, um, Roderick Long and many others have spoken about um, this idea that we are the government, right? No, very Rothbard originally, but um, so that this this language has incredible power, right? Uh, to me to realize so yeah, yeah. um do you want to sort of could wrap up yeah we could um i do want to i actually did want to touch upon just one more thing before For we sure. wrapped yeah, up we and, then we can, final. and then we can finish yeah. um and this is a bit unrelated but it kind of it does tangentially relate to what we're talking about i wanted to get your opinion specifically on um the idea of because i, I know we were talking about free will and sort of what Saz would think um, is Saz critical of like what we would now commonly refer to as um, race science or race realism or uh, racial determinism when it comes to the link between what we would call intelligence and predetermined genetics. This idea that um, your genes can, to a large extent, um, literally just predetermine and pre-wire um, your level of intelligence. And Are you saying you, was he privy to that, or did he know about it, or did he not we, care? Or? Yeah, well, I, I, all of the above, basically. Okay. Well, I'm gonna be honest. I don't really know. Um, my perspective. I can tell you what he probably would think, although I don't know particularly. Sure. Uh, the best I could give you is that um, I'm sure he knew about it. I'm not sure he cared too much to comment on it too much. Mm -hmm. Um. Because it really wasn't, it's kind of one of those things that's in his domain, like he could talk about it, but it's like, might just not be worth going down that rabbit hole for him. I don't know. Sure. Um, but I can tell you that he probably just, about genetics broadly, is that, you know, are there sort of large genetic trends? Well, sure. I think that that, that makes sense. And do genetics play a role in who you are? Sh yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, because these are our, uh, there's a there, there's a very clear causal mechanism here, and it's all pathologic. It's all pathological. We can determine. It's all physical. It's within the realm of medicine. Um, so it would make a lot of sense that these would have an effect on you. Um, however, um, just the fact that there are outliers, because none of these rules, and to you know, there are different sort of confidence levels. Um, and you know number of outliers for each specific thing you know if you know the genetic correlation between a uh, missing 21st chromosome or whatever it may be and down syndrome is much higher than it is for other so-called you know because it's difficult tracking conditions versus behavior mm -hmm. um i would think what says would probably say um something along the lines of like first of all like there has been, I would argue that there probably has been no like way to sort of like determine beyond like macro trends, 
you're going to have a hard time making this cause a link and therefore you're going to have mm -hmm. a hard time defending it. Right. So it's like, how are you going to, like, first of all, you have no gene identified, maybe a section of genome, mm -hmm. uh, but you have no allele. Um, and even if you did have an allele, which sometimes they say they do, I mean, this was a huge debate with the gay gene, right? They thought like they had it, maybe they didn't, I right. don't know. But it's like 2024, it's kind of simmered down a little bit. No gay gene, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have it. Uh, and this is because, uh, at least within uh, biology, specifically neurology, but biology is sort of larger, there's no such thing as like isolation. Uh, similar to economics, right? In the real world, anyway. We have Ceteris Paribus, but the difference with Ceteris Paribus is that economics is a is a is a the lo logic of human action. Mm -hmm. Medicine is the, is an empirical study, largely. It has logical assumptions, but you can't isolate. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, there is no affecting one system, if you will. Uh, it all gets affected. Um, so I think SAS would probably say something like that. And then also probably say, okay, well, let's say your genetics do predispose you. Let's say we can like hurdle this. And if, unfortunately, a lot of it is like being a pain in the ass with technical arguments. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, this fMRI study said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you got to go in and you got to say, well, what the fuck is this? What, like, fuck the MRI machine, right? You have to kind of go in with that perspective and say, no, but FRI machines are limited. And here's, you mm -hmm. know, they're limited because, I don't know, what's one example? They're limited because, you know, they measure uh, the influx and outflow of blood in such crazy small quantities that it may not even matter, A. And B, the inflow of outflow of blood moves sometimes significantly slower than the inflow of outflow and outflow of electri of electrical signals. So maybe there is activation in a lot of parts, we don't see it. Maybe the blood sticks around longer. I don't know. You know, most of the time we're not mm -hmm. screening these people for create for intricate uh, intraneural blood clots. So who knows? Um, mm -hmm. Same thing has to be done for genetic science here, to which I can't give the same specific critiques because I don't care as much um, and haven't looked into it. Um, but I think that is an, that, I hope that is somewhat satisfactory. Um, sure. Well, it was more interesting to me because it seems like if he's going to take the the free will position, it seems like that if you're going to argue in agreement with the racial realists, um, that you essentially have to accept, you almost like have to accept a form of determinism into your argument because it seems like this idea of literally the the way that you process your brain the, your spending habits for instance um like like i know i know um like i know i'm fairly sure like hoppe for instance thinks this where he 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 seems to argue that um that your time preference for instance um is is essentially genetically determined like your the, like the reason why you make decisions yeah, yeah, yeah at least to some extent has a genetic origin and that genetic origin can also be defined in racial um, among racial groups, not not just among averages, because he does argue averages, but he cites a lot of like race realist science, like um, um, what's his name, uh, Felipe J. Russian, I think. Um, oh yeah, cites, yeah, yeah. He cites people like uh, like he, he's had like Richard Lynn at like the um like the PFS. Like I know Rothbard also has defended like race realist shit, like um with mm. the bell curve things like that. Sure. So I don't know. Like I'm not like I'm not like adverse to it entirely like the the notion that there could be some genetic component i just i just really haven't seen the evidence a lot of the evidence seems to me literally just being okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna essentially use core we're, we're essentially just gonna take a bunch of um different racial groups and then say um okay what what um what's your what's your iq score for instance among yeah. these racial groups what's the average and then we'll compare for like a few factors um, and that, and then from there, we're just going to assume that there's some genetic component that's yeah. predetermining your behavior. Which, yeah, I think I the know. problem is that, yeah, a lot of these, you know, assume the macro trends are well-established, which some mm -hmm. of them kind of are well-established. Um, why they're genetic, the leap from well-established macro trend to mm -hmm. genetic causation is one that has yet to be effectively made considering the lack of efficacy in the field of genetics not on the on the part of the stati statisticians right um, but on the and the problem with genetics why it's i am much more favor in the view and that it might be an epiphenomenal type of thing um in the sense that you know uh you know heritability for example which is uh you can have non-genetic heritability 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, you know, my parents yell, I yell. Okay, is that yeah. genetic? Probably not. Probably just environmental. Um, and there are sort of uh, cycles of cultural reproduction, which I think are much more apt. To I just, I'm not like there's no like proof that this is the case. You can't prove that like a theory in the cultural sense or a sociological sense is the perfect explanatory factor or you know best descriptor but mm -hmm. you can sort of do clues it's kind of again like when we go back to the, the schizophrenia or, or like uh you know traits specific medical traits of of um mental illnesses so to speak it's like okay well is it more likely that this is a disease that happens to affect males at the age of 19 to 22 and then it's has a sudden onset when it coincides with like stressful times in their lives or is it more likely that they're just acting or malingering right. or something like that? Well, you have to kind of go with the you have to kind of go with the more likely explanation here too. And I think yeah. there are some theories that explain it much better than just mere macro trends do. Although again, with these sort of race realist types, you can't. Um, it's something that people who in these sort of ultra libertarian circles who. Um, aren't race realists have to grapple with because ultra libertarians i think are one of the most open-minded people just point blank because first of all they've sure. already gotten outside of this sort of overton window of acceptable beliefs and doing that yeah. alone is just a feat into modern days we don't even talk about think about how most people are just like have the same but it's crazy how most people right. have the same political views it's just absurd to me mm -hmm. um Regardless, um, but I feel like, you know, they also, it's like, because we're so entrenched in the economics, politics, but specifically the philosophy, you know, a room full of philosophy majors, I was in a philosophy class and, you know, in the lower level class, you talk about killing someone and they, and they gawk at it. But in the higher level class, this guy brought up an example. He was like, so let's lock a blind deaf baby in a cage and don't give him any sense of sensory deprivation, sensory deprivate him. And instead mm -hmm. of like the the awesome cool philosophy majors being like, oh, how awful, they were all just like, no, continue. I want to know what happens when you stick right. a baby in a cage and don't give mm -hmm. him any stimulus. I think that's how Austro libertarians are most of the time. They're able to grasp, grapple with hypotheticals that seem absurd to almost ninety nine point nine percent of the population. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And as such, um, they are charitable when it comes to these race realist things, and they are aware that you can't like if you see some of these studies, some of these facts statistics stories whatever you may call it you can't just be like what the that's, that's nope, not real you can't do that you can't just like yeah. play that card uh you have to meet these people sort of on their ground a little bit right uh, that's so that is that is the avenue you have to take you can't and i think it's good you, that can't, you, just, do that. you can't just dismiss it as yeah like fucking oh it's, oh it's just kooky race science you know like who cares it doesn't fucking you actually... work bro like you, you yeah exactly first of all, you're gonna get fucking destroyed like you know oh yeah for sure for sure and, and and here's the thing too is that i um like this is why i have a problem with a lot of the people who will just because i th i think the reason why um and I'm, and I'm actually gonna make this point if i do get around to making a video on race realism and my criticism of it specifically like within Austro libertarian communities because because i think because of rothbard and hoppe's influence specifically it's sort of it, it's become a lot more it's a lot more mainstream in like right austrian circles than it is for instance in a lot of other circles um so i might make some kind of critique of it in general but yeah. i think the reason why it is adopted is because i think i think what has happened especially with the bell curve releasing in the early in the mid 90s as it did um, it sort of set up this very false dichotomy among two views. Essentially, you have the uh, race scientists who believe that, um, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to blame this on genetics. And therefore, all these welfare programs, all these affirmative action programs, all these state programs, these aren't actually going to do anything. You're not actually helping the situation because primarily, you know, some people are just stuck where they are and they're fine with and, and you should just be fine with people on average and groups of people, even races being different. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, to, to some extent, I would agree. But I think they they use they use some tricky semantics when it comes to, quote unquote, differences. But um, and then there's sort of the more leftist perspective where it's like, no, it's actually down to environment. So therefore, we need the state to come in and fix their environment through these different avenues. So. 
like, do you see where this kind of false dichotomy comes in? It seems like that in order to have a really good argument against the leftoids wanting government intervention, it seems like race realism and race science is a very good, um, a, a very powerful tool to add up because if you take that position, then you can argue, well, well, hey, I mean, all these programs, they're, you know, there, there are differences among people. They're not going to help, you know. Yeah, I just, I, I have sort of a. The problem that I also have with this is, they're not behaving. The people who espouse these theories do not behave just like it's a theory, right? Like, I wish I had a good, ex, a sort of good way for this. The race like, realist types. Yeah. yeah, I think it just, it just doesn't seem like it. It doesn't intuitively intuitive intuition moment but intuitively it doesn't there are value judgments which are there which i don't think quite necessarily i mean you know when it comes to ethics yeah there are also value judgments but there's sort of uh goal-oriented value judgments and then arbitrary or means oriented value judgments so there's a difference between making an arbitrary statement in ethics that is just a direct representation of your value judgment, which is like, I think that, like, I don't fucking know. Homeless people suck, and we should kill them, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which is different than a structural or goal-oriented value judgment, which thinks that perhaps the human flourishing is akin to utility maximization. Okay, that's a little bit different. Um, both subjective, unfortunately. Um, I will live by the unfortunately part, but... Um, the, these types, I feel like whenever I'm in a sort of like a race realist argument, it just is kind of like, there's no realism. It just kind of seems like racism. Yeah. That's just kind of how I personally feel. It just seems like, it just kind of seems like, they, it's like, okay, well, you've had bad experiences with some minority. Pretty much always that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a sort of a generalization. Um, well, you ha well now you have this science that says, okay, well, no, it's it, it's not just these these one-off experiences that I'm dealing with in my day-to-day -day life, and it's not even and it's not even also because of environmental factors that are keeping these people down. And if these environmental factors are removed, they'd be on the same level of us, or or they are on the same level of us, you know, generally, but you know, they're just they're just they're just crippled you know like they're locked in a cage or whatever yeah um, they have this racial theory that says well no actually no no it's not even environment it's the it's the fact that they are black you know it's the fact that they they have their shitty black genes that are forcing them to spend you know like yeah. all their money on diamonds and you know listen to rap music and shit like yeah i don't know it just it just comes off as like patently absurd and then i think you have you also have the problem where they are trying to treat it as scientific so for instance like i think charles murray has said something to the effect of, well, um, okay, um, you could argue, for instance, that um, there's this genetic co component that makes black people less intelligent, but, you know, if you want to put a value judgment on intelligent, you can, or you cannot, you know, maybe you value, maybe you don't care whether someone is intelligent or not, or maybe- Yeah, I mean, the most common care, one I right? hear is like- so, degradation yeah. of society and shit like that but. right so, so i think i think the issue here is that okay well you can argue that um <laughs> oh justice came in he's just saying sub um so like you can argue for instance that sure maybe maybe if you don't want to place a value judgment on intelligence you don't have to so therefore yes race realism would be scientific but on the other hand it's like Okay, well, do we gen genuinely generally value intelligence? Would you maybe look down on someone if they weren't intelligent? If you put a value judgment on it, it would be very easy for you to do so. You know, if you had this scientific theory, for instance, like proving that black people were, um, I don't know, black people had a predisposition to scream at the top of their lungs in public places, and most people generally don't like screaming in public places. You know, I mean, that that basically is saying that black people are inherently inferior in the same way that you would say, like, you know, oh, well, black people are just inherently less intelligent. I mean, that is kind of you saying that, yeah, black people are inherently, inherently inferior. The only way that, for you to not argue that would be to say that I don't place any value judgment on intelligence, but I feel like we all do, you know, even scientists. I think this is one of the things, I, I'm going to be honest, there's just so, this is, this could have do its whole, this topic could do its own y yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, thing sure. and i i for sure am not educated enough on it at all 
I just right. don't like. Um, yeah, I just I it's it's not my hobby horse. Yeah, fair um, enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could we could probably honestly end it there. I, the, the reason yeah. why I wanted to ask you because I feel like it was a very good. T- I've been um I've been looking into it a lot recently. Um, because I it's it's been on my mind a lot. And when you brought up, um, sort of the idea of free will and determinism, I think that's a very interesting parallel. I was actually yeah. talking to the MRH about this. Um, whether or not race realism is even praxeologically compatible, and. I'm open to it, but I'm also a little bit skeptical just because it, it feels it feels almost de- like not just deterministic in nature, but almost like it almost denies that means and ends like well, the behavior even exists among human beings. Yeah, I think. Well, I think because, part of the yeah. thing is, is also just like. Um, will forever be burdened by the ambiguity and re- Mises is writing when he starts talking about reflexive action versus saying i mean right to be honest those like two pages my opinion unpopular opinion kind of sucks it's like i need more than that i need a lot more than that and sure. it just gets so complicated yeah. so quickly um yeah it, it, but, i mean it, i feel like that could be that could definitely be a debate in austrian circles because it almost seems like really like any behavior that you cite to someone like let's say um like, let's say if we wanted to know whether a black person was acting, you know, praxeologically when taking an IQ test, if you were to take the race realist position, I feel like they would just say, well, no, 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 they weren't acting purposefully. They were just like they were just predetermined to have that low score yeah. because that's... their genetics are, are are dampering their intelligence, you know, in the same way that like of... in the same yeah. way that like animals animals behave you know we wouldn't say animals are praxeologic agents i mean well some people do but it feels like if you're going to take the race realist position it seems like you could deny like prax to a lot of a a lot of people you know i think that is this is a very hard problem because you know what this goes back to what i think it is almost exactly akin to does when does praxeology start applying to kids you want to talk about yeah. a, a rabbit hole? Oh, yeah. Fucking, oh, I God. I hate, hate that. Yeah. I hate it. It's I difficult. It because yeah. the answer, you know what the answer is? Is the answer is no answer because praxeology right. is atemporal. There is, it, what, like, it's not, it's atemporal. There's no, it doesn't yeah. account for time necessarily. When I say yeah. that, I don't mean the time preference isn't a thing, but I mean, like, there's no, like, theory now versus theory later. It's just static. Right. Whereas, humans grow <laughs> that's kind of yeah. the problem um so uh there are different theories of well some actions are purposeful some aren't honestly it's really fucking hard especially when you take into account roger Long and then like nix all of the shit about psychologism um i yeah. don't know if you have read the wicked w- wiki draft do you know if another um one? i i <laughs> mrh legacy mentioned um yeah i am familiar with it a bit yeah, that is uh if you want to like solve a lot of problems about prax, that's your go to. That's like the it just read the whole thing, I promise. I promise you will like you'll be like holy shit, this is the holy grail. And then you're going to love Roderick Long and then read all of his shit and then realize he's like pretty good but not the best. And that's how it's going to go. That's how it went for me. I mean, well, I love him. You know? Well, interestingly enough, I have um I have not re- read the Wiggy draft, although I do want to. I know it's kind of like an infamous within Austrian circles. Like he yeah. he's a very really, he's a great economist, and I like how he explains a lot of things. Um, I'm like I've kind of taken the like I take a lot of influence, and this is probably going to get me this this will, this has gotten me a lot of shit before, but I take a lot of influence from like the long guy, you know, C four SS crowd kind of. Yeah, I could tell. Um, y- yeah, I mean, so like. I, I don't take like fully my influence from them, but I I think they have a lot of things to value. Yeah, that, that, no, I, I I tend to agree with you as well. Yeah. Although um, not too, I think they're pretty cool. Um, you Georgist or not Georgist? No, no, no. Okay, then I can live with you. You're okay. I've been like I've Anti-Georgist. talked about my skepticism. Well, I so like I don't like Georgist, but I have been I have talked about my skepticism of um, land homesteading. Again, sure. I don't really have like a full on like I'm I'm very open to it, but um, oh yeah yeah, uh, Cuban Pete, uh, Georgism is the real mental illness. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, yeah. I would convince. Honestly, me. honestly, maybe the real mental illness was the friends we made along it's the way. The friends, yeah. We, yeah, perhaps I think, perhaps. Yeah. Um, 
ma- mainly just because like with land ownership, it's it's very tricky when it comes to things like fencing as a standard of okay, well I can claim land land ownership of this oh, patch started. of ground, you know, because oh well look look I fence in this area. Well okay, well what if you what if I fence just around me or i fence yeah. a little bit more around me can i claim the outside or i don't want to yeah that that's just it just, it just gets really complicated you, you want to know, so know I feel like, actually what? oh sorry i don't want to interrupt um but um q and p made me think of something that i have yeah. thought of myself this is like dark sass okay. i call this i call this variant dark sassianism okay. um hold on one sec I wish I could change my profile picture to make it dark, but I can't edit, edit it quick enough. Oh, um, dark Saz is to say, right, so there's there's sort of like the Sazian project, mm-hmm. which is, of course, Saz's proposition is the abolition of involuntary psychiatry, which entails no insanity defense, no civil commitment, no DSM-5 in schools, and mm-hmm. no forcing drugs on people, all that good stuff. Right. Holy based. But Dark says says, well, this is the most powerful tool of social control. So what if we used it for ourselves and let's make socialism and communism mental illnesses? And we're gonna call them oh. something like pathological <laughs> thievery. Right, because well, that's what it is, right? It's or fail or something like delusion of of proprietarianism, sure. right? This is, uh, and this is not something Sass did himself. This is something I have derived from Sass, um, right? And it's kind of like um, when you know libertarians may talk about using the state to do away with the state or do some sort of pretend, like maybe set society up in such a manner that it may that it is is then ripe for, right. Um, you know, ripe for dissolution. Mises um, called it the uh, Fourier Fourier com- complex. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. I just googled Fourier complex. I'm not seeing it. What are you talking about there, Marich? I'm not really seeing a lot of that. Fourier right, complex describe the ends sought by those who dream of the world envisioned by Charles Fourier. Utopist. True. Yeah. Maybe well, actually, true. you know, you know what is funny about that. Um, I'm so I'm actually I'm I don't know if you know about this, but I'm working on a book. Well, it, it is a, it's going to be a book slash video essay, but. Um, it's going to be like probably like six hours, maybe five hours long. Um, it's in the uh, in- introduction of liber- liberalism. Yeah. I actually I need to read liberalism because again, I, I'm, I'm like sympathetic to liberalism, but obviously like I have problems with it. You know, it's you know, small government, et cetera. But um, sure. Anyway, um, what I was going to mention is um, fuck. Oh yeah, uh, Fourier. So I'm doing a I'm doing a video essay on the um, history of the libertarian movement. So I'm, I'm going to be going all the way back to like. The start of the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, um, awesome. how yeah. liberalism emerged, and then basically going through uh, Proudhon and how like libertarianism has its origins in socialism, but socialism used to mean something different back then. So, and, and then of course I'm going to be going through like the divide between the Marxists and the anarchists in the First International, and essentially going all the way up to Rothbard and you know Austrian school and etc. But I'm gonna be I'm doing a section on the utopian socialists, and I'm doing a section on Fourier. And in my research of Fourier, um, the guy was fucking insane. So he he had this idea of, um, and this was most of the the utopian socialists. They had this idea where, um, okay, maybe we don't use the state as a tool like with Marxism, but maybe we use, maybe we set up these own utopian communities um, where we just share everything, right? Um, sure. And so what Fourier imagined is that there would be these communities called phalansteries, and the idea was that everyone in that community would be able to pick their own job, right? But the job that you would be picked would be paid in accordance with um, essentially not the value quote unquote it produced, but how difficult it was, you know? So if 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 you were being like a ditch digger, you know, and, and it was very, very difficult for you, then you'd be paid the most or however it would. Yeah, work, yeah, right? yeah, of course. Um, I've heard, so, I, know, I know this concept, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's the crazy, so he um, basically, he considered um, trade, like just the idea of exchanging shit um, to be inherently associated with Jews. Um, and so he considered the idea of trade to be because of that, um, the quote, root of all evil. 
Um, and, and so basically, and so as a result, like he, he, in his phalansteri idea, he would allow Jews to enter and become, and be part of the phalansteries, but he would basically, he wouldn't allow them to pick their own job. They would just all be subjugated to do farm work. Basically the Jews would do the farm work, you know, uh, the Jews. So, you know, um, you know, yeah, all kind of based, you know, Thomas no, Saz was Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. Taz Jewish, Wait. Mises Jewish, Rothbard Jewish. What do you guys? Bro, think it's about? a it's a consp it's a Jewish conspiracy. Honestly. You know, it's interesting it's how Jews take the uh, perspective. Uh, Jews dominate all intellectual circles, except the anti-Semitic. It's very interesting. It's always interesting that one. Crazy. What is funny though is that I actually have heard Nazis argue that that yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like libertarianism is a co-opt because yeah. Um. But anyway, that's that's yeah. my that's my anecdote about Fourier. He was fucking insane. Alrighty. Well, I think we can. Yeah, we can we can wrap it up there. All right. Um, do I have any closing thoughts? Not really. Yeah, I'll um, let me let me link the um, I'll, I'll link the William F. Buckley thing, and then if you could also send me the um, you want me to send that to you like soon, or can I? Do, I'm like bleeding out of my eyes right now. Or does oh, it matter when since when I send it to you? I can do it now if you want. You can you you can send it to me whenever. Um, I'll I'll just I'll just update the description to include it whenever you send it to me. So okay, then I'll probably I'll what do you want? I'll send you like three videos and then like a paper. Do you want any papers or not really? Oh well, well I was wondering. Um, not even just the papers. I just wanted to see you to send me the um the invite link to your server so I could post that. Oh yeah, I get you. I'll get that to you. Yeah. Okay, I'll sweet. Send it to you. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll let you I'll let you go. Uh, it was a really long conversation, but I think it was worth it. Yeah. I think it was great. A, yeah, we yeah. got. We'd we'll love done. to have you back on again because yeah, we probably have some more things to discuss. Honestly, yeah, that sounds good. You know, I can maybe do like a re you know we can dive more into specific things because this isn't over. And I didn't even get to touch on things like civil commitment and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. defense and whatever else. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. So there's all a whole world of this guy. So yeah, we could probably even to touch. Yeah, we could probably even touch more into like specifically how. Um, like just empirically, how the state uses psychiatry as a oh, yeah. mechanism, and a lot of other shit like that. Like sure. the history of these institutions. But there's yeah. many, many ways. Yeah. But thanks for thanks for having me on as well. I appreciate it. It was great. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, thanks for spamming me in DMs asking to come on. <laughs> this was a great episode. What are you talking about? I, I, I mean, uh, I didn't do that. I, I, yeah. Yeah. It's it's all in my head. I'm mentally ill. Yeah. Actually. But I'm gonna call. You're 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 done. McCall I'm sorry. I, 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 I was just a joke. I made I made it up. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, you're in delusion. That's that's okay. True. That's very fine. I will diagnose you later. Okay. Well, anyways, um, I think we're just gonna wrap it up here. And yeah, yeah th thank you, Dan, for being such a good guest and, sure. and just being really chill. Yeah. We had, yeah. Uh, got a lot of great insights as well. So. Um, and it. and yep. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, thanks MRH for coming in the chat. Thanks Pete. Thanks. Everyone I'm Pete, else came in, huh? Uh, Pete, I'm Pete. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, yeah, I just wanted to. Oh. I use the George's. See, that's the real mental illness. Is I, uh, yeah, I just wanted. Oh to yeah, yeah, okay. Further okay. my own agenda, so I used a fake persona. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's how it goes. Okay, well, well, anyways, I think we're gonna end the stream here. Uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in, and um, yeah, we will. Uh, that was a big reveal. Oh, you, bro, you just you played your cards. Shut up. Any Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for coming on, everyone, and uh, you guys have a great episode. Oh, yeah, by the way, next episode uh, on March 18th, so in one in one week and seven days, we are having Per Byland on the stream. We're going to discuss some cool shit, so tune in for that. Get one up by myself right there. You get one up on this podcast. Oh, yeah, shit. I'm, I'm so Go sorry. From unknown guy to Per Byland. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a, good, it's a good concept, though. Go on, yeah. Yep. Okay, but but anyways, uh, f final goodbyes for everyone. We'll uh, we're we're gonna end it here, and uh, thanks thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a good one.